Good morning, and can I welcome everybody to the 14th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015. Can I remind all those present to ensure that all electronic devices are switched off? Um, they sometimes do interfere with the sound systems, as I'm sure you're aware. Our first item is to take evidence on Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People. Uh, the Commissioner has completed a mapping exercise showing, exercise showing the scope of his new powers of investigation and has submitted a detailed report to the Committee for consideration. Um, we'll hear first, however, from the Scottish Government about their expectation of the work involved for the Commissioner's Office as a result of these new powers, uh, and then we'll then speak to the Commissioner and his staff. Can I welcome this morning, um, it's not, I was going to say panel one, it's not, I'm not sure if one person is a panel, but uh, uh, Philip Rains, who's the acting head of Children's Rights and Wellbeing from the Scottish Government. Uh, good morning, uh, morning. Philip, and thank you for attending. Can I kick us off, Philip? Um, can I just ask for your, the government's view in general about your interpretation of the, the scope, the limits, if you like, of the new power that have been um, assigned to the Commissioner as part of the passing of the Children and Young People Act? Okay, Convener, thank you very much. This, this is on. Excellent. I guess, in a sense, our view has not changed from the passing of the bill. I mean, the bill is only a year old, um, and the, the thinking that went into that bill, which was set out in the, the key documents in which uh, you and many of your colleagues, uh, it's been well rehearsed in front of you, has been there. And I guess the simplest way to put it is, um, I guess, proceeding from all the debates within the legislation about the best way to embed um, a rights-based approach across service delivery. There was that widespread recognition that having that, if you will, hardwired, embedded within the role of the commissioners, uh, the um, um, the Scottish Commissioner's role going forward in terms of revising the 2003 legislation would be a way to ensure that that was captured and be captured particularly with respect to the United Nations Convention, Convention on the Rights of the Child. I think it was always recognized that it would be a very complex landscape, the rights-based landscape, that um, there were clearly going to be very ch great challenges in terms of the Commissioner's Office and indeed all the complaints bodies in being able to work out whose role was most appropriate in going forward, particularly with respect to the issue of duplication. But I think we recognize that having the office there as a way of ensuring that that's, there was a comprehensive approach towards um, the um, complaints, the, um, if you will, the challenges that might be made on issues to do with children's rights was one that we valued and indeed many stakeholders valued as well. I guess one thing I might add is um, it's something that maybe was a theme within the, uh, the, the discussions that went on in the run-up to the, um, uh, in the, during the passage of the legislation, but I think has maybe come out a bit more strongly um, through the passing year, and I think is something that comes forward quite strongly in the report, and it's maybe picking up a theme that the Ombudsman made in his submission, uh, or their submission to, to this committee as part of the passage of the legislation, and it's that there, is, there does appear to be a significant issue about children and young people being part of the complaints landscape. There do appear to be recognized challenges about how they should be taking part in that landscape. And I think there's, a, in addition to the, the value that we, we continue to see within the uh, part two of the legislation, there's maybe an additional benefit that comes for having the uh, commissioner's office as a way to help children and young people, if you will, get in and make the best use of the existing complaints landscape. That's a value that it seems the other complaints bodies are uh, acknowledged and one that um, I think comes out quite strongly from the report. So if you will, I guess it's in a sense of scope and in a sense of the, the direction we would wish to see the, um, the legislative duties be taken, I think there's an added benefit there about the role they can have in terms of, I think the word I would maybe use is enhanced signposting to support the, uh, the existing uh, complaints bodies. I'm interested you said that about the signposting or I, mean, I, was, I was going to use the word gatekeeper. I'm not sure if that's appropriate, but signposting um, young people, children and young people to um, perhaps a more appropriate place to take their case. Um, when we wrote to you um, at the time, you wrote back, not you personally, I can't remember if it was you personally, I don't think it was, but the government wrote Probably back not. and said, I want to quote, we would therefore not foresee there being a role for the Commissioner to have extensive ongoing involvement in a case prior to local processes being exhausted, mm -hmm. etc. I'm just wondering whether, how does what you just said about the role in the early part of a case fit in with the, the, the letter you sent us um, 
earlier in the year, or last year time possibly? The key thing is to get involved in those processes. I think once those processes kick in, it's absolutely right that those processes should be uh, allowed to go forward. And I think any confusion of that would probably just um, would make the, the landscape even more complicated. But there does seem to be an issue about being aware of what processes are there, um, how it works going through, what have you. Um, in a sense, enabling children, young people, and presumably their families, to be able to take full value of those processes. There does appear, I think maybe over the course of the year, it's become even more apparent that there is a role in which the uh, Commissioner's Office can play which will help to do that. I don't see that as um, getting involved in the processes themselves necessarily. Um, and I think we would want to, we would still hold by what, uh, what was written to the committee at that time. But I think it's just appreciating, if you will, the work that goes on before that stage is maybe something that we can become more mindful of. It's the nature of legislation, the nature of new duties. As you get further into it, you begin to appreciate that there are elements of it that may require more, uh, more consideration, more thinking through. And indeed, there may be additional value and benefits that come out of the duties that maybe weren't uh, wholly apparent at the time. I think that ability to get into the complaints processes is one that is perhaps worth acknowledging. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and I come new to this, and having read the, the report, which I think is, is a very good report, what concerns me is what you've just said, Philip, in terms of uh, legislation, as we go through, we have to, you know, understand the changes. How much effort went into looking at the, not just the processes, but the organization and how this whole thing would flow before we brought the, the, the original act uh, before the uh, legislature? I mean, I, I get kind of concerned when, you know, officials come here and say, well, you know, there's legislation, but, uh, and we accept there will be fundamental changes, but I, I, I have to question what mm -hmm. processes you went through in the, the various other bodies <coughs> to make sure that the landscape wasn't complicated, that mm -hmm. it was as easy as possible? We went through a very thorough process. We went through, we would have to do so it. So why is the landscape complicated? The landscape was complicated coming into this. The landscape was complicated by the nature of the, the different bodies and the different roles they already had. That existed well before the 2014 Act and existed before it's one of the reasons that we were, um, that part two was actually set, which is, um, I guess, in part a way of thinking, is there ways of ensuring that in all that complexity that children's rights were addressed in a systematic way across the whole of um, all the areas that you would want it, to be, you want it to be picked up. As part of that work, we had to do very thorough work in terms of, for example, the financial memorandum, which is, in a sense, working out what it is that the commissioner's office may have to be doing what kind of resources they may require. And that required quite extensive uh, liaison with the other complaints bodies, not least the, the Ombudsman, the Care Inspectorate, and the Human Rights Commission, but also actually seeing how it was done in other parts of uh, the, 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 the different nations of the UK, Wales, Northern Ireland, what have you. How many bodies did you, when you looked at them, felt that there might have been a better way of doing things? I'd have to go back and actually check with colleagues about the specific discussions I'd had that took place because I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't at those discussions, but certainly all the reports that I, I heard at the time, I sort of had overall responsibility, I guess, for the, the bill team going through the legislation, going through, going mm -hmm. through Parliament at that time. But there was, no, um, there was no sense at all that there was maybe other ways of doing it. I think there was a recognition that every nation will have its own distinctive legal landscape, its own complaints landscape, so therefore, what precisely works in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland should not um, be replicated wholesale, obviously, in another part of the, in any other of the, the nations. But I think there was a recognition that in those other nations, the Children's Commissioner could have a very powerful role. Now we have a, a slight, we have a, we have a different landscape here, and how that role translates in Scotland was something we thought long and hard about, both in terms of the uh, proposals that were put forward, uh, and indeed the actual drafting, and indeed was was well discussed as we passed through. Uh, not least stage two in this committee. So I think there was a recognition that um, there would be a very powerful role to be had, but it would need some careful thinking, and, a lot of, and that careful thinking was done. No, I mean, I agree with that, but the question has been answered in terms of 
you know, we're still maintaining all of the other complaints bodies. My question is, in looking at the overall, as you say, process, mm -hmm. were all these other bodies necessary or the very powerful position that the, the Commissioner has and should have? Why didn't we look at some of these, these complaint bodies and try and embrace them into uh, fewer organisations? That would have swept up a much wider, I guess, revision, uh, reform of the complaints landscape, which I think would have gone well beyond what the Children and Young People Act was envisaged to be, done, to be doing. I think there was a recognition that, I guess to give an example, um, as, part of the, as part of the work that was done into looking into assembling the material for this report, I was part of a, um, a conference call that went on with Welsh colleagues, particularly the Welsh Commissioner's Office and a number of other colleagues elsewhere about how complaints procedures worked, worked out in other parts of the UK. And what really struck me about what was going on in Wales was that you had formal roles and they had to be respected and you, had, um, uh, you need to have clear memorandum of understanding in order to proceed. But what was fascinating, I think, was the fact that there was a spirit of cooperation. There was a feeling of they all shared the same goals and therefore it was all about the relationship building that worked. I would hope that that sort of attitude would be something that should lie at the heart of how we work our way through from uh, in terms of how the complaints procedures should apply to children, young people should also should apply to children's rights rather than uh, relying wholly, I would say, on the, on the clear legal definitions, memorandum understanding, which are essential, but I think it's that spirit, that relationship that's important. And I guess our feeling or the feeling that's embodied in the Children and Young People Act is that it's that relationship building that remains very important. We'll come back to it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Mary, Mary uh, Thank you. Um, I was surprised to uh, read this 90-page report, 18-page summary and all the other documents. It's taken seven months uh, for the Children's Commissioner to, to complete. I was surprised to read uh, that within that uh, they'd uh, hired the services of senior counsel. Now that doesn't come cheap. <laughs> um, but they hired the services of senior counsel in order to interpret both words and clauses within the bill. Now, as a member of this committee, we have no access to senior counsel. Uh, and I know as an economist, uh, uh, another economist could totally disagree with my interpretation. And I know that our justice system thrives on senior counsel, lawyers and judges, both interpreting legislation in quite different ways and with the best will in the world there is always a degree of ambiguity despite everyone's best efforts. Um, having read the interpretation by senior counsel, uh, is your view of that single, we've got nothing to compare it with, is your view of that accurate? Do you think it's been interpreted accurately? You won't be surprised to say that I won't be commenting on what the legal opinion that's been taken by the yeah. Commissioner's office. I guess at the end of the day, the Scottish Government has its own legal opinion. That legal opinion clearly deeply informed the way in which the Part 2 was cast, um, the way in which we um, shepherded it through Parliament, what have you, and our expectations around it. Um, and that would be the view that we hold. So, to be honest, I'm not sure it would be appropriate for me to comment on another legal view. No. Like yourself, I have an economic background. I think one thing, as an economist, I'd be wary about is wandering into other professionals' territory. Indeed, indeed. Well, that, that's, I, I'm glad you said that. That's my issue today. And I respect the fact that you cannot comment. And as an economist rather than a lawyer, I find it difficult to comment also. And I'm, I'm sure you understand that. Uh, so I just go on to my second point. Um, I'm at a disadvantage because I wasn't here during the consultation stage one, two and three. My colleague Liz Smith uh, uh, followed that process through. Um, but uh, can I just ask you about the named person? Mm -hmm. um, buried away in page 46 of the Children's Commissioner's 90-page report is a mention of the, the named person. Um, uh, if I can just read out, it's worth highlighting, Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 gives ministers powers to introduce new complaints procedures by regulations relating to named person part 4 section 30 and the child's plan part 5 section 43 
Uh, this will be consulted upon in summer 2015. Now, given that, uh, and I respect and welcome the fact that that will be consulted on, in your response to Chick Brody and throughout all of this, and I have read every page, there is undoubtedly a complex and cluttered landscape mm -hmm. for the complaints procedure through various organisations. Um, if you're about to consult on the complaints procedure for the named person, uh, I actually find uh, there's hardly a mention of the named person in here. Mm -hmm. So will it be the case that, uh, well, can, can I put it to you? Would it not be wise to look uh, during your consultation at the complaints procedure for the named person at the same time in the same act as looking at the investigatory powers for complaints for the children's commissioner? You know, I can't understand why the government are carrying out a consultation exercise, which I welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And today we have to make a decision about one part of this bill and you are about to consult on the complaints procedure for a different part of the bill. Mm -hmm. Would it not be wise to carry out one consultation exercise to see where the Children's Commissioner fits in and where the named person fits in because there is no mention in all these documents of the named person. Okay. It's quite a lot there, so let's see if I can unpack well, it quite succinctly. Well, I'm trying to succinctly. understand no, no, no. it as well. I hope you appreciate that. I do, I do. Yeah. And so I uh, just hope I can do it as succinctly as I can. So my apologies if some of it is, is, is maybe too succinct. Um, I guess the first thing to say is the, there is no consultation, if you will, on the, on, on the um, and we have no remit as a Scottish government for doing a consultation on the part two powers. So uh, what for we have... For the commissioner, you mean? Yeah, for the commissioner, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we don't... So that is a duty that falls upon the Commissioner. I think it would be inappropriate for us to be able to say we're going to consult on how the Commissioner should fulfill their duties, what have you. Um, that's, those powers aren't in the Act and I think we, you know, it would be difficult to imagine how we could do that in a formal basis, which is just, that, that, that's just a straight up answer. Um, more deeply, the complaints procedure within parts four and five are kind of they're, they're essential because they're dealing with this new responsibility that will be falling on, uh, on the main local authorities for kids from the age of five upwards and health boards for kids up to the age of, up to the age of five. Um, and that is to do, I guess, with the specific functions and responsibilities that will be coming out of parts four and five of the Act, to do with the name, person, the child's plan. They, uh, that is quite different, or at least I would argue that's quite different from what the Commissioner is being charged to do under part two of the Act. Um, the Commissioner doesn't have a role with respect to, doesn't have a formal role under Part 2 with respect to the, the way that Parts 4 and 5 act, the way that name, person, the child's plan works. Now you would hope... Um, There's no overlap there. The overlap... You haven't consulted yet. I guess the overlap would be in the, sen would, would be in the sense in which um, um, the, the, I guess it's the theme that runs through the whole of the legislation, which is to say we wish for all the different functions, all the different parts of the Act to be carried out in a way that is wholly consistent with children's rights. Um, we wanted the UNCRC to permeate this legislation. We wanted this to be um, a very much a rights-based approach to carrying things forward. So when we're thinking about parts four and five and the way, the way that's carried forward, we want it to be carried forward in a way that recognizes children's rights. And I can assure you that when we do come out to consultation, um, as we will be doing over the summer on the complaints <coughs> procedure for parts four and five, we, we hope that that is very transparent, very, that that children's rights approach does permeate in terms of a philosophy. But I guess what the complaints procedure to do with parts two is, is, is a distinctive, it's a distinctive role. It's something that sits above, for example, the complaints that may sit uh, against how a teacher may carry out their role, how a health visitor may carry out their role, how a social worker carries out their role. And I guess in the same sense, the named person is part of, um, maybe is more akin to that sort of way of thinking about the complaints process, how a particular professional or service that should be provided to a child, a young person or a family, um, how that's carried out as opposed to something which is more overarching, which is what part two is trying to capture. I do think you point out, you, you do make a very important point though, which is that in coming out with, um, 
the complaints procedure and indeed in thinking about how all the different parts of the Act, I think it's incumbent upon all the people for whom there are duties to show how these different things work together. I think it's very, while they are distinct and they were always designed to be distinct and to serve particular functions, I think it's important in us to show not least to children, young people and families how those different functions fit together. So there is a, if there's something indeed I would walk away from your question with, I would, it would just reinforce for me the importance that when we do go out to consult on the complaints procedures, we absolutely do need to make clear how it fits in and how it is distinctive from other parts of, if you will, the complaints landscape, but also other parts of the legislation that it may touch upon. I mean, quite if, I'm still struggling to understand one example that would justify these investigatory powers, but the closest I probably got to it would be social work, you know, th that would be the closest. And yet you say that social work complaints would be covered under the named, named person. No, no, no. Let me be you clear. did mention no, 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 social work. No, no, let me be clear what I, um, and my apologies if I wasn't very clear about that. What I was saying is I that the probably complaints. Probably didn't understand it, no, but no, you no, did no. mention social work. I did, I did. I guess I also mentioned teachers and health visitors. I think what I was suggesting is that the complaints uh, procedures with regard to the named person and child's plan are similar to, for example, the complaints that someone might wish to make about any professional or any service that is provided by a local authority and health board. And that could mean social work, it could mean health, it could be anything. So in other words, it's about a distinct service which there's a responsibility for local authorities and health board to provide. That's what the legislation says. It says they must provide the named person and where appropriate they need to provide a child's plan. So the complaints procedure will be similar, I guess, to how complaints procedures address those other sorts of issues. We need to work out the detail about it, but it's that kind of thing. Whereas I think what the, the, the complaints procedure has set out for uh, the Children's Commissioner's Office is, is a more overarching thing. It sits, if you will, at, above that and it deals more specifically with the issue of children's rights. Okay, can we, and I don't want to take up too much time, Sorry. so I'll just ask my final okay. question, although I have many, many questions. Um, I've also read uh, the comments from the Ombudsman, mm -hmm. the Care Inspectorate, Human Rights Commissioner, Health Improvement Scotland, Information Commissioner, Mental Welfare uh, Commission, and there is absolutely no doubt, as you said in your response to Chick Brodie, of their willingness to work together. But there's also no doubting the overlap. And there's also no doubt of, uh, sorry, if I can just say, um, Care Inspector, clearly an overlap. Uh, the Information Commissioner, in all the reports, I think it's what the convener said, there's very little mention of working together. There are also uh, the nature of the complaints, unpredictable and undefinable. Uh, uh, She's also concerned that the proposed met methodology is too simplistic and in some cases unworkable. Um, and I, I thought the Ombudsman's comment, I would not consider it appropriate to comment on the interpretation of another office holder of their own legislation. And actually I read it carefully because what I was looking for was for one of them to say, we don't deal with this, we really need a complete new body children's commissioner to do this because we can't do it. But what I read was of overlap, willingness to work together. I also read um, of the, the difficulties uh, working together. I think it was the information commissioner that um, some information cannot be shared. Um, uh, duty to cooperate, others have restrictions placed on them. Um, you know, all I heard was, was difficulties and I still, after 90 pages, seven months, summary documents, uh, information, I am still sitting here struggling to see what are the complaints that were turning away just now, which, what What's happening out there to children who are making complaints and they're being turned away, they are not being served by our current system. And I've read all of this and I still don't have it. That, Perhaps you could Well, that me. may well be a question you wish to push well, to, who's being turned to, away? to Mr. Bailey, I guess. Uh, because well, I, I guess thought it's his I'd try report. with you first. Well, 
always good to have two bites of the cherry, I guess. But um, mm. I mean, my sense from the report is um, that it, it is a complex landscape. It was a complex landscape that was inherited that, by the legislation. Yeah. Um, my sense is, from having spoken to many of the individuals involved, that there is, a, as you say, a huge willingness to work together. Absolutely. Um, and a recognition of the value that could be played in perhaps I might say in an informal way about, I mentioned before about enhanced signposting, but about that role about working together to help kids and young people but get into the system. Sorry, there's a big difference between signposting and investigatory no, powers. No, 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 I do, I do. I that, mean, I'm prefacing my comments. I understand. Yeah. But investigatory powers are very different no, no. to signposting. I mean... No, no, I understand that, and I, I was coming to that. Two different beasts. I was coming to that, but my sense is, from the report is that there are clearly areas which are set out which... Um, where it would appear that the Commissioner's Office uh, is able to step into a role that is not uh, readily identifiable than anyone else would. I mean, there's, I think there's an uh, example there about an informal exclusion from school, I believe. Uh, Name, named person? No, no, I don't think it's that one. It's, no, uh, but it's, an, it's under chapter. Not be involved in an exclusion from school and social work? They might well do, but I think if uh, we're talking about the complaints, I don't I think, think it would be, be it, I'm not sure it would be the name person who would be responsible for the complaints in the same way that, you know, we're, we're talking about something, I think, where the complaint may be made against whoever the responsible authorities are. from school, mm -hmm. my understanding is that the name person would get involved right away. To Have resolve I misunderstood it, yes. That yes. But that would be their... That would be their responsibility to go to the family, social work, see what's happening. Absolutely, Strive and that would be out. that would be the way of resolving the issue, I guess. The so that's not a clear example, then. Well, no. I guess the suggestion is, if it was not resolved, uh, if if the work of anyone involved with the schools or the local authorities did not resolve the issue to the satisfaction, I guess, of the child, the young person, the family, uh, and maybe this is an example you may wish to ask Mr. Bailey about in more detail, but um, um, it would not be. Again, if there was a sense of dissatisfaction there, how is that dissatisfaction taken forward? And there did appear to be an example there, and there does appear to be examples about sectors and areas where, uh, at least with regard to children's rights, there doesn't appear to be a clear locus or responsibility for any of the existing complaint bodies to be able to take forward. So I certainly see that there are areas here of things which the office could take forward. I think what the full scale of that and the scope of that is, is something to be explored further. I would suggest. Well, but I yeah. stop you, Mary. Sorry. Sorry. I think, that was, that was, I think uh, there are other members who want to come in there. I'm, I'm sure you'll have further opportunities later. Uh, Liam McArthur. Thank you, and apologies for uh, being slightly late this morning. Um, just looking at the back at the committee stage one report on the bill, um, I notice, uh, or I'm reminded that two of our recommendations were. Um, we expect all parties to be clear about the interpretation of the Commissioner's new powers and suggest that, if necessary, the bill should be amended to ensure this. It goes on, uh, we recommend that the Scottish Government gives further consideration to the volume and type of work that any extra inquiries will require. Now, in response to that, the Government gave us an assurance effectively that they felt this part of the bill was was clear in the financial estimates fair. I mean, I paraphrase, but that was broadly the, the gist of, of that response. Given that we've um, and I had a number of months, um, a fairly comprehensive mapping exercise, and there's still questions uh, around these areas. Do you think that the Scottish Government was justified in the assurances it gave us uh, in response to that stage one report? I guess the assurances we gave you is that insofar as any of this work can be calculated and worked out in advance, we've made every effort to be able to exhaust, um, if you will, the assessment about what the likely volume of, and the likely nature of the work would be going forward. Um, I guess inevitably with these things that there will be, I think it was always a recognition that we need to be further work um, from the Commissioner's Office working closely with uh, the other complaints bodies. And I see that the, the report here is obviously a significant step forward. Presumably, um, and when it comes to actually detailing the memorandum of understanding that I think would be needed and which seems to have been recognized across the board as needing to be done, that would be where I guess the final detail of that will come forward. And then it may well be the case that it would need to, um, I guess, see how the demand goes forward going in terms of the, uh, the types of complaints that come forward and how they'd be dealt with. But I guess at, at, you know, at the moment, there's nothing I think that would change our 
would change, I guess, the fundamental assumptions that went into the financial memorandum. I think, I mean, there you've, you, you've rather reiterated again, I think, points that were made in the, in the government's response that, um, that there would be a, a, a sort of uh, an ongoing process of keeping things under review and ongoing discussions between various uh, participants in this, uh, in this area, um, which I, I don't think is, is unreasonable. But uh, as a committee, and I suppose um, the, the, the corporate body of which I'm, I'm also a, a member as well, has a, a fairly specific request in terms of the capacity requirements from the Commissioner to, to deal with um, uh, the increased workload. And I still don't have a clear understanding as to, and I don't think anybody um, seems to be claiming to have a clear understanding of what that likely workload is going to be. And therefore, mm -hmm. I think we're in this invidious position of, of, of trying to um, uh, determine whether or not the, the, the specific proposals in terms of the capacity requirements of the Commissioner and his office mm -hmm. uh, meet the anticipated um, workload requirements that arise from this bill. Mm -hmm. It would obviously be a matter for, for yourselves and for the, the, the office to decide, I guess, how best to resource in those circumstances. I imagine um, it won't be the first time where there's, there's an element of, uh, if, you will, if you will, demand led, and that demand may not be necessarily certain about how to uh, predict that demand going forward, and therefore, I guess, a degree of caution and wariness and mo close monitoring of how those resources are doled out over a period of year, maybe several years, would ne be necessary. It, it doesn't sound different in nature to the way some of these functions are carried out where there cannot be precise estimates of demands. And I'm sure in some ways the Ombudsman's office, when it was maybe starting to ramp up in its initial days, I think way back, um, you couldn't have made the same predictions about how complaints will evolve. But in a sense that would argue for a, 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 a sort of staged approach which says, look, we will, we will see how this works in practice and therefore the, 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 the capacity requirements of the Commissioner's Office may increase over time, but actually putting in that resource in anticipation of potential demand some years down the line doesn't necessarily make a, a great deal of sense and potentially risks putting in place resource that then seeks to justify its presence by, by, by going out and, and, and perhaps disrupting this, 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 this kind of um, ecosystem of MOUs and, and, and collaborative working with other stakeholders, is it not? That's clearly a decision for yourselves. I mean, it would be inappropriate for me to, to comment on it. I, I guess I would only offer the observation that it sounds to me that this is not an unusual situation to get in where there is a body that will need to, uh, cannot make a an, an accurate, an exact, if, if I will, and final estimate of what the demand will be over a period of years. And therefore, um, there will be well understood principles for how to resource and monitor that sort of situation going forward in a way that would give comfort to the body to be able to fulfill its obligations um, and also comfort to the, the, the funders to be able to realize that they, they've not uh, given resources away that couldn't, should not have been given away. Thanks. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. I want to come back to some of the points that, that Mary raised at the beginning. If my understanding was right, you suggested um, that there might be scope for signposting. And under the 2003 Act, it says there is restriction to this power is that the investigations must not duplicate work that is properly the function of another person. And Mary went through a lot of the, the um, concerns of other organisations about the duplication. And I, I read what the submission that the um, Commissioner put forward to the corporate body in terms of job descriptions. And it says, head, one the position is head of complaints and investigations. And it says to lead investigations which arise from complaints received by the office. And the case worker um, part of the job description is to assist the head of complaints and investigations in the execution of formal investigations. And then the actual budget itself has a very small budget, I hasten to add, for expert advice. Does that sound like an organisation that's being created to act as a signposting organisation or is it an organisation that's being set up that is going to go into that minefield of duplication? 
I would suggest it's neither, actually. I would suggest that it's, um, I mean, I don't wish to comment on the resources which um, the office is putting forward and requesting. We've set out what we think the costs would be very clearly in the financial memorandum, which uh, I'm in front of me, three additional full-time equivalent staff, and we set out what we thought they might be. And that's to cover an organization that would be conducting um, investigations, that would be doing the preparatory work for the investigations, that would be doing the work for determining what would be appropriate to take for his investigation, in other words, non-duplication, and that would be dealing with the, um, if you will, the interest and the demand that would come uh, into that organization for people saying, I wish to make a complaint, in which case they may, they will have to work out who sits with that, or, you know, who sits with the, the, um, the, the commissioner's office and where, where it sits elsewhere. So it's not, it's, it's not a signposting organization, it's not an organization seeking to duplicate, I would suggest, um, in terms of what we envisage in the financial memorandum. It's something which does all the necessary functions in order to fulfill the duties under the Act. The difficulty I'm having is the Scottish Information Commissioner says for some organizations, including mine, there are restrictions on what we can share with whom. For us, these restrictions are such that they create a criminal offense and cannot be overcome by a memorandum of understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how can you create a third investigative body which can't get any information from one organization because it's a criminal offence? Well, I presume that if there's any memorandum of understanding that would take place or however it wishes to be phrased, it would need to take full account of what the Information Commissioner's Office is able to do, not least with respect to issues that might be about criminal offences. It would just become part of the landscape that would need to be mapped out, that would need to be understood before um, any work goes forward. I would assume that in the existing landscape before the 2014 Act, some of those issues may have already, must have already arisen. Mm -hmm. These four bodies must have um, bumped up against each other, if I could put it that way, themselves. So some of the issues that are being arisen, some of the need for having clear lines and understanding can't be, uh, can't be novel to them. There must be issues that they have recognized and addressed and have found, I presume, formal and informal ways of going forward again, of working their way through. So while it's, it's a new set of issues, that needs, it's a new body that needs to, I guess, be part of that landscape, I'm not sure the, the, the process of adjusting to that landscape is something which is novel, because other bodies have had to presumably do it in the past. Okay. Colin? Thank you, Peter. I mean, practically everybody's been uh, skittering around and, and discussing the issue of the boundaries and, you know, where, where perhaps there, there might be overlaps and so on. The report itself doesn't deal an awful lot with where collaboration and cooperation as such could come into this. Do you think that, I mean, it's a very complex landscape out there. It has been repeated again and again and again. Isn't this a huge task to reconcile all these boundaries and overlays and collaborations and cooperations? It's a major task. It's a task that seems to have been done um, in other parts of the United Kingdom. And as I said before, I was very much struck by the, the spirit of cooperation, the strong relationships that were developed elsewhere where um, people worked with each other with a degree of respect, with a degree of recognition of where expertise lay, and they managed to find ways through it. They managed to find ways through it in a way that seemed to ease the administrative burden and not, not add to the complexity. Now, how they managed to do it and whether that could be replicated in Scotland is um, something I think we would all have to look to the complaints bodies and the commissioner's office to be able to demonstrate and to do. My understanding from the discussions I've had with them uh, when I have chatted is that there is very much that spirit of cooperation. It's permeated many of the responses you've seen, um, and I think it certainly lies behind um, some of the comments Mr. Bailey has said before. If it hasn't come out as much in the report as it might have done, that's maybe uh, something to pick up with with Mr. Bailey about how that cooperation might work in practice. Do you think it's any more complex here in Scotland than elsewhere? I don't know. I think every area will probably lay claim to its own complexity, the own idiosyncrasies of, the, of its system, what have you. Um, I'm a great believer in thinking that if everyone remains focused on what the ultimate goal is, which is you know, to ensure that children and young people, if you will, are done right, 
by the services that are there to provide, you know, f there for them, and that we provide the right kind of supports and safety nets to make sure that um, where that isn't taking place or where it's perceived not to be taking place, they can they can get the redress, if you will, that 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 they should have. If people remain focused on that, they will find a way. They seem to have found a way in other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, I see no reason why we shouldn't, we shouldn't be able to be hopeful, why we shouldn't remain very optimistic that it could take place here. Given the number of overlaps that uh, have been identified, I was interested to see that uh, obviously the, the, the idea is that the Commissioner does not duplicate. But I see that uh, the Commissioner on page uh, 6 of the summary report uh, highlights the uh, opinion of Council that the other person, the other entity, doesn't have to exercise that power which is duplicated merely by having it precludes the Commissioner from exercising that power. That, 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 that could severely constrain what the Commissioner can do given the sheer number of overlaps as I say and the fact that all these boundaries are still got to be negotiated. Where are we going on this? I mean, how are we going to end up with a commissioner that actually won't have the powers that we think he has because the powers are, 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 are at least partially duplicated elsewhere and even if that other party isn't exercising the powers, the commissioner can't do anything about it? I mean, ultimately that would be a comment on the legal opinion you received and um, I'm not in a position nor I think would, I be, would it be appropriate for me to do that, I guess, because that's I'm more partly... concerned about the results of that legal opinion rather than the legal opinion itself. Well, that will come out, I guess, in terms of how the Commissioner chooses to carry forward with the duties and how, he, and how the other bodies and the relationships they come to, I guess. Um, and as I said before, if there's the will and the spirit of cooperation, they should be able to do it in a way which enhances the landscape rather than detracts from it. Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Rains, for appearing for the committee this morning. I'm going to suspend briefly uh, so we can change witnesses. Thank you. Can I welcome uh, to the committee this morning Tam Bailey, Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People uh, and his staff, uh, Pauline McIntyre and uh, Nico Juton. Uh, good to see you all this morning. Um, we're going to go straight to questions uh, and I'm going to begin uh, this panel's questions with Siobhan. Thank you, Convener. Um, children and young people don't currently use the systems that are there for complaints procedures. How on earth will this change? Because in the 90-page report, I didn't get the sense of, of how it will change. I, I got the sense of what you hope to do. I got the sense of the procedure. But how will that change for a young person? I'll answer that quickly, and then I'll pass to Paul in terms of the model of operation. But uh, we've taken soundings from children and young people. You're right. They don't use complaint systems. Part of the reason they don't use complaint systems is they don't think they'll be listened to or taken seriously uh, and in fact that's why 
our national scrutiny bodies of which you've been discussing this morning uh, don't see children and young people because they don't even get past the local authority. Our job will be to engage or the local sorry, the local uh, processes, not just local authority. Our job will be to receive the complaints from those young people and assist them through that. We're well used to dealing with young people. We have got um, a lot of engagement with children and young people through the office, and I'm sure that we will be able to actually set the office up in a child-friendly manner that will attract those children and young people or those representing them. Probably. I suppose what I'd say, having listened to the first session, is that this is really about opportunities for children and young people. I think we've talked a lot about some of the barriers and some of the difficulties around duplication. But I think our take on it is that children and young people often have a valid reason to complain, but just do not know where to go. The complaints bodies that we've talked to and the regulators have been very clear that they would welcome those complaints, but that they don't currently receive them. I think what we'd be looking to do is to provide that centre where children and young people could come I know that we would support them to bring their complaint to the appropriate body. I think that's the approach that we're taking. One of the things that came out of the discussions with children and young people and also with practitioners was that children and young people could be quite intimidated by the idea of bringing a complaint, particularly where it was about someone that they had regular dealings with, so a teacher, social worker, mm. case worker. Um, and they often weighed up the impact of making that complaint against the value of bringing the complaint itself. And I think we would be able to help with that in terms of our approach and bringing a child-friendly um, feel to that complaints process. I think the other flip side to that is that we would also be able to help the other bodies and work with them to ensure that their approaches were child-friendly and that the response that the child or young person received when they made their complaint was appropriate to them. I suppose in your answer, Pauline, you said children currently don't know where to go. I think everyone recognises that. Yeah. So, so how will that change then? I mean, obviously, you can put all the procedures and all the policies in place to allow a young person to complain. Um, but when they don't know where to turn to, how, how is that going to change? How are we getting that information out there? I think there is a body of work for us to do as an office in terms of letting children and young people know <coughs> about, <coughs> excuse me, about what our role is and how we operate. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of us linking in with local organisations working with children and young people, with general publicity, with targeting particular groups that we've found that are finding it more difficult to complain. For example, asylum seeking children, we've been told by practitioners, find it very difficult to navigate the complaints landscape. Younger children find it difficult, children with learning disabilities and, and other groups of children and young people. So I think it's a, it's a kind of dual approach. We would be taking a, a general approach in terms of publicising the work of the office and, and what we could do to assist, but at the same time we would also be targeting particular groups that we were aware found it more difficult than others to complain. Okay. I mean, we're just having a discussion there. My colleague Chuck Brody was talking about you have to get it right now or indeed you know, when you become an adult you've already got that experience of being let down. And if you look at the legal opinion that you've received in the EHRC's response to that about how if they don't investigate you don't have the power to do so. Um, that limits. So a child comes along to you and says okay they didn't do it but we wish for you to investigate. Do you not think then that they would be let down at that point? I don't know. Would you like to answer that Nicole? Is that uh, yes, um, so I believe what you're referring to is um, the part of the legal opinion that was already cited earlier, uh, which is that it's the, another person's function that would in exclude um, the Commission's agreement as opposed to their action. And that, that is what the legal opinion says. And yes, there will be um, situations where um, <coughs> um, <coughs> another body has a function to investigate a complaint by a child, um, but for their own reasons will not take action and will not investigate that complaint. Um, that will pose challenges um, to that child and to potentially even to the credibility of, um, of our complaints system when you, when you think about it. Um, so I think it's a communications challenge um, as, mu as much as um, anything else. Uh, it needs, decisions need to be explained properly to children and young people and um, what the expectations can be from, from each process. But, so if, there were, sorry, but, but sorry, if there were to be gaps in, in the system as a result of that, yeah. I think they would need to be addressed. I'm not quite sure I agree, though, that it's a communication problem. Because the <coughs> HRC said you cannot duplicate the work that is properly the function of any other body, oh. even if we decide not to undertake an investigation. I think your remit is narrow on page 51. Mm. And then we go to the Information Commissioner, who said 
So we would be breaking the law. It wouldn't be a memorandum. It would be, so it wouldn't be communication. It would be oh. we can't simply do those things. And therefore, a child has presented mm. himself to you who may not mm. have done that in the past, may not have known where to go to. Once their complaint dealt with, mm. and I'm, I'm trying to get to where your response is, do you say, actually, we can't deal with that because the information commissioner won't give us the information? <coughs> so really sorry. Or we're going to try and circumvent that somehow? I mean, I'm just trying to get to that doesn't come across and therefore really we're still with the children and young people not using a complaints procedure. We're still stuck there. Yeah. It doesn't matter what complaints process you look at, uh, local or national, they all have limitations on them. Uh, and what's been referred to, in, for instance, the Information Commissioner's response is specific limitations on the legislation with freedom of information. Uh, and yes, she did indicate that in certain instances she would be obliged not to share information because that would be breaking the law. But if you also read that, you'll see at the bottom that she sees there's still scope for a memorandum of understanding. So it's not in all instances and it doesn't exclude working arrangements with that particular Commissioner's office. Uh, and the key point here for me is it's a very complicated landscape. Everybody accepts that. We find it complicated. How much more complicated do our children and young people find it when they want to complain, when eventually they get an issue which they feel confident to make a complaint on? They are going to need a lot of assistance through that. And part of the, our response will be to help them through that, particularly at local level, because they don't even get past local complaints processes. That's why the, the children and young people don't figure in the complaints processes of our national scrutiny organisations. It doesn't get to that stage because what the children are looking for is some kind of resolution and a resolution that doesn't compromise them with people that they have regular dealings with. So, so I we'll get to that stage is what you're saying? It may do. Uh, I mean, I think the two outcomes of the bulk of the activity of the office will be either resolution without it going through any complaints process because people will have the opportunity to take a second look at it or that children are assisted to navigate local complaints processes and inevitably there will be some that reach the national bodies. But really what we're looking at here is not to generate an industry of complaints, it's to get resolution for children and young people that feel in some shape or form their rights, interests or views haven't been taken properly into account. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you heard my question earlier to, to Mr. Reins regarding this complicated landscape. I'm a very simple person in terms of you know, just looking at how do we get outcomes simply. Who actually, apart from encouraging children to complain, who actually do you believe owns the outcome of the complaint given this complicated landscape, which I'd rather call bureaucratic bunkum? How do we get through that? Yeah, I mean, who, owns, who actually owns the complaint, resolves the complaint without, I'm sure there could be cooperation, but through this whole tunnel, dark tunnel of communication, the communication challenge which has been mentioned, who answers the children's questions and resolves them and who has the authority to do that? Okay. That hits at the nub of how complicated matters are. And in fact, I'll refer you to something that was said by the Information Commissioner in her response. And it said, this complaint, she'd outlined a complaint about social work. So this complaint would potentially overlap, and it's illustrative, not comprehensive. The local authority, complaint has to go then before it goes to SPSO. SPSO, the Scottish Information Commissioner, the UK Information Commissioner, and the Human Rights in uh, Commissioner. Because of the complicated landscape, you actually have ownership, as you describe it, located in a number of different places depending on how it's sorted with the, or what the details are of the complaint. So of course the people that own the complaint uh, are, I would say, the young person who actually wants some resolution and the person or bodies who've got responsibility of that could in fact be any number of bodies. And in fact the Information Commissioner helpfully goes on to say that it sounds like a criticism but we haven't paid sufficient attention in that early stage of the complaint resolution, even although I think that the bulk of the activity that we will be involved in is, it, is, is actually in the early stages before it gets anywhere near investigation. 
because of the complex nature of it. That's why you need specialist, knowledgeable staff to actually tackle this area. And that, was, that comment was made frequently to us. Well, I understand that uh, and, and, and I appreciate the answer. Yeah. Uh, and I have no doubt that there will be cooperation. But my objective, I'm sure your objective, in, in, and, and I you applaud the report as being helpful. I wasn't here when the other one was produced. Um, but saying it's the children, it, the children have to be encouraged to bring complaints. But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to get to is who in this huge bureaucratic landscape is responsible? I know you have to call on experts. Yeah. yeah? I know, that, and, but I'm still not clear. Can you just tell me, in terms of, we heard about your conference calls and talking to Wales and what have you, in terms of the wider international uh, landscape, uh, what evidence do you have as to how um, the objectives that I, I seek uh, are being addressed? Okay. Uh, if a complaint comes to, to ourselves, then we will take the responsibility of seeking to give best advice and it was mentioned about uh, enhanced signposting. That's an awful lot more than just pointing a young person or a family in the direction of a particular body. We will take responsibility of contacting those bodies and ensuring that if it is another body's uh, responsibility, that that is taken seriously and is actually passed on in a way which facilitates the resolution for the, the child or the young person. The experience of these other bodies is that the involvement of the Commissioner's Office actually generates or facilitates a resolution in itself because the organisations don't want to have complaints. What they want is actually, uh, in most instances, the best interest of the young person and some kind of resolution. And other international bodies? I mean, other international uh, other international bodies? Well, you have, you, you have um, um, uh, many ombudspersons in Europe carry case handling responsibility uh, and in fact uh, uh, our Nordic uh, colleagues uh, are facing the same criticism from the, the UN committee as the UK faces which is that our commissioners don't handle individual cases and we're in consultation with them because they're very interested in developing case handling responsibility and I I my uh, direction of travel is a growing number the majority of ombudspersons and children's commissioners have case handling responsibility and we've got lots of models to be able to, to, to use. We use the comparisons of Wales and Northern Ireland because they're closest to uh, our own jurisdiction and they're under the jurisdiction of the UK. Uh, we in England don't have case handling responsibility and there's a particular issue for that in England because of the huge size of it. Well, at least that seems one step forward in terms of who will have the, res the responsibility. Mm. Thank you. Um, uh, before I bring in Colin, just, can you clear something up for me? Because it came up previously, and I think it's come up again this morning from, from hopefully what I've, if I've listened carefully to what you've said, uh, Mr. Bailey, you, you mentioned a couple of times things like you, you would help them through it, the young people. Yeah. Or uh, uh, another phrase I think you used was you'd, you would help them mediate through the process. Um, now, the reason I'm asking about this, I want you to cl clear this up, because um, this, these kind of phrases were used back at stage one mm -hmm. when the bill was going through. Um, we asked the government about that at the time. I, I read it out earlier, but I'll read it out again. The letter to the Committee on the Scottish Government clarified, and it said, we would therefore not foresee there being a role for the Commissioner to have extensive ongoing involvement in a case prior to local processes being exhausted, and it is not our view that the Commissioner should take on, a, on any mediation-type role. Uh, that was backed up by uh, the Minister, Aileen Campbell, when she appeared before the Committee. Um, uh, as well. Now, I'm just trying to understand, when you say you help them through it, you will mediate through the process, and the government says that you won't have a mediation type role, what, is, there a, is there a problem there? No, but I think it might be helpful because it, to talk through some of the examples, because it's come up this, again this morning about clarity of uh, um, our actions. And I think it might be helpful just to talk through some of the examples that we've given in the final chapter of the report where we gave three examples and gave, I think, quite detailed uh, description. I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to, to do that. Yeah. But I, just, I just would like a relatively simple answer before we do that as to whether or not you believe that your powers allow you to be involved in this mediation type role, mediation through the process, I think was the phrase you used, or, or not. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to understand because, I know, I know you want to use the examples, but yeah. I, 
you know, in, in principle, is it the case that you would be involved in that mediation or not? Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think I used the word mediation. I, feel I, I thought you did I, say did you did would I? mediate through the process earlier on. Did and I? then, you, okay, then later on you said you would help I me stand corrected it. if I used that. Uh, um, we'll, we'll double check the OR afterwards. But I, I, I think you did. <laughs> I'll stand corrected. But I, I, I do want, I, I think it would be helpful. I don't, I don't see any um, issue of us being involved in a case to assist the young person to get involved in local complaint processes. That's, so I think, I, that's the question I think that Lee you're asking. Lee MacArthur. I, I mean, I, I, my recollection is the same as the, uh, as the conveners on this, although looking through the, the note for today's meeting, I, I, I see there's a quote from um, Aileen Campbell from um, 17th December where I mean, she confirms the point about exhausting local um, uh, dispute resolution processes but then goes on to say however once those processes have been exhausted we would not want to prevent the Commissioner from mediating on an issue where such a course of action was likely to result in the matter being resolved more quickly and effectively than it could be perhaps achieved with a full investigation. So I think after the processes have been I, Well, indeed, but I think, I think the use of the word mediation has been used at different stages in relation to different, um, uh, mm. different aspects of the, uh, of the process. I'm not sure it gives a great deal more clarity, but I think probably the, go the government have used those in different contexts as, as well, which is not necessarily ways. helpful. No, I, 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 don't want me, I don't want myself and Ms MacArthur to get in an argument here, but I, I think the point here was that it, the question I'm trying to ask about is about mediation in the early stages. Through the, when we're talking about the, the local processes, as opposed to the quote from Eileen Campbell, which was after local processes have been exhausted, then there may be a role for the Commissioner to be involved in mediations. So I think they are two, two separate things. Um, so can we go back to the, the local processes? Yes. Uh -huh. are, 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 would you or would you not be mediating through that process? Uh, we would be assisting youngsters through that. Yes. So if you want to describe, I, 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 if I use that word, then... Well, let's I'll forget the correct. word mediation then. Are you involved at, the, absolutely. at that point? I, absolutely. We would want to assist youngsters to access those local processes because that's a major gap in our system right now. Young people and children don't use them and they don't use them because they don't feel listened to or they, don't, they, uh, they actually don't want to escalate it. What they want is some resolution to their, their, their situation. Is there anything to prevent you from, from assisting a young person now in terms of where they go in terms of taking their complaint through the local process at the moment? Um, in terms of our, our current powers, mm -hmm. we do not have uh, a, a, an end point on that. Which would that, be that's not my question, though. I mean, yeah. My question is, if a young person came to you just now and said, I've got... I think I've got a complaint about something to do with my local authority. You, uh, could you assist them in the way that you described there at the moment? Uh, in a limited way, because we would, we would not have uh, any capacity to ask the local authority about the specifics of that case because we don't have individual case handling responsibility. We're specifically debarred from that under the 2003 Act. But we so, um, so I, I don't want to get picky on this, but yeah, there is okay. a, there's a difference between assisting a young person and responsibility. And I think there's also a, a, a difference here because you're not supposed to get involved. I mean, I, I go back and quote it again, but you're not supposed to get involved at the early stages as per the quote I read out earlier twice from, from the government. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand whether or not you're involved Assisting somebody and just saying, well, here, here's how you take it forward and this is the way you do it, perfectly understandable. But the, the government seem to be quite clear that their interpretation of legislation is that you do not have a role in these early stages of the process. And, and again, our 2003 legislation, as it stands and as it will stand from this legislation, is as long as it, that, that we cannot duplicate uh, that which is the responsibility of another body. That's why you would actually try and get the young person to use what those other bodies are, essentially that the first port of call would be local processes. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to... No, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm well, let's go to the examples then and see yeah. whether that... Yeah. Yeah. Just part. before we go to the examples, I suppose maybe just a, an additional point just to answer your question. I think it's about the level of support that you're providing to that child or young person. That's of what I'm course, trying to get if to. a child or young person brought something to the office at the moment, we would try and direct them to the right process. But we don't have currently the setup to enable to, us to do that in the way that we would like to do it, in a way that we think is child and young person friendly, in the sense of 
what we would want to do is not so much mediate on behalf of the child or young person. I think that's a bit of a misnomer. It's about supporting that child or young person to access local processes. And in doing that, you might, for example, find a local advocacy support worker who could work with that child or young person. You might find another support agency who could then support that child on the ground. It's about making sure that as you transfer that child or young person into that complaints process, they're in the right place, they have the support that they need, and also that the other body is prepared to deal with that child or young person in an appropriate way, so they know about the, the particular needs of that child or young person. So it's taking a holistic approach towards it, whereas at the moment we're quite restricted. We don't have the staff to enable us to take that in-depth approach, but we think that's the most child-friendly way of approaching this. So, uh, so you, you, you almost, yeah, I was about to, about to leave it until you, that last sentence. This is where my concern is. It's about, and you're right, it's about the level of involvement. Mm -hmm. that, that's fundamentally the question I'm asking. And you said you don't have the resources at the moment to take forward an in-depth. Now, my interpretation would be that you're not supposed to take forward an in-depth in depth in the this sense. point. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I would say it's in-depth not in the sense of us actively becoming involved in that case. It's in-depth in the sense of us being able to take the time to identify the most appropriate support for that child or young person. So it's not about us actively being involved in that case, it's about us identifying that support and identifying um, which route to, to put that young, child or young person down. Okay, thank you. Colin McDonald. Co sorry, Colin Beattie, I do apologise, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies, Co Colin, Colin Beattie. Same with your style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you just look the same guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I take it as a compliment here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, like to give you, I'd like to come back to uh, talking about these boundaries and so on. Um, according to, according to the, the specifications on your powers, they're rights-based investigatory powers. The concern, of course, is where there's overlaps and duplication and so on, because as your own counsel stated, if that other person has any of that power to any, any de great degree, then whether they choose to exercise that power or not, it would exclude the Commissioner from actually taking action in that case. How would you deal with that? If you felt there was something that was going to be, that needed to be addressed, but there was another body with the, say, with the powers that wasn't going to do it for, for any reason. How would you deal with that? Yeah. You're right to point out the, and it's already been mentioned this morning, about the narrowing of the scope of the exercise of the power because of the wide range and implication of that uh, uh, non-duplication. In fact, that's one of the reasons why the estimate of number of investigations comes in at, at so low as one to four. We will develop, and we've already been doing that during the mapping exercise, relationships with those other bodies. Uh, and we would certainly be wanting to seek some reasoning or rationale as to why that body wasn't um, dealing with that particular uh, complaint or that particular uh, issue. Uh, but a memorandum of understanding couldn't possibly envisage the, the variety of cases no, that might no. come forward. Yeah. So uh, there would have to be a resolution. Yeah, and memorandums of understanding will be necessarily won't be able to go into the won't be able to predict the range and variety of cases that are likely to come through. Um, so I, some of this, some of the level of memorandum of understanding will be set in a framework. Some of it will actually be establishing custom and practice mm -hmm. as to how we operate with those other bodies. But clearly, the memorandum of understanding it'll be quite important. Yeah, but. What happens if there's a dispute between yourself and, uh, and that body, either mm. in the course of producing the Memorandum of Understanding or subsequent to that? Who adjudicates? Who would decide? How would, how would it be resolved? Yeah. Before I bring Nico in on that, I, my, 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 my sense of the, the relationships that we've been establishing with the other bodies is that it's been very cooperative. You've seen, you've already been quoted, the other bodies are uh, in agreement about establishing memorandum of understanding. We are an established office. Uh, I think that people will be professional in dealing with that. 
and uh, people are, are, are of a mind where they want something, they want this to work rather than have uh, disputes on it. But inevitably, some people will have differences of opinion. I am absolutely confident that we will be able to work through those. I'll say that, and I, I mean, that's on record. Absolutely confident that we will be able to work through that. And that's on the basis of our experience of putting together this report and looking at what are the implications of what is quite a complicated exercise. The level of goodwill has been very high, uh, and I don't have any reason to doubt that that would continue. Hmm. Nicola, do you want to say something? Like that? Yeah. Um, just to echo that, if both, well, assuming it involves two organisations, any kind of dispute over where the boundaries lie, both organisations would be expected to approach that in good faith and uh, to um, find a negotiated way through um, to any disagreements. Um, in the end of the day, I have to say that the terms of the non-duplication requirement in the Act, or as it will be in the Act, in um, Section 72A, is essentially that the Commissioner has to consider the evidence and any information received and then be satisfied on reasonable grounds that the investigation would not duplicate work and so on. So the judgment in terms of individual decisions is for the Commissioner to be reason satisfied on reasonable grounds whether there is duplication or not. For those decisions, the Commissioner can be held accountable and ultimately through the courts. If, if somebody disagrees with the judgment in an individual case and says, well, actually, we have power, I'm sure they won't be shy to come, to come forward and, and, mm -hmm. and have those discussions in good faith. But ultimately, the backstop is judicial review of the Commissioner's decision. And then the Commissioner will have to show that the decision will, uh, was made on reasonable grounds, on relevant evidence, um, a rational decision. It's a, it's a general principle of public law and one that will apply to the Commissioner's decision making. But if there is a turf war, and it happens, with the yeah. best will in the world, it happens, and yeah. you've got a child in the middle of this perhaps, yeah. how do you resolve this quickly? Who adjudicates? You talk about judicial review, does the child have to wait for that judicial review before there's a decision? I think, that, I think the answer to that is that um, it's in the child's best interest and in the interest of all organisations involved to make sure that we don't have to get to that point. Well, because that, because that, will take, that will take, as you've rightly pointed out, that will take time, expense and all the rest, and that's not in anyone's interest. So well, we'll I would hope that everybody would have the, the, mm -hmm. the child's interests right at the forefront there. Yeah. But with the best will in the world, again, you could end up with two organisations that believe they have the child's best interest <laughs> at the forefront, how do you resolve it if there's two different points of view? Yeah. I suppose the reassurance I would give you is that the overlaps are all over the place in this landscape and currently our existing bodies manage to resolve that. So it's not intractable and we should take the evidence of how the system operates at present and that is that in my uh, estimation people are very respectful of other organisations and that at the centre of it is somebody, either an adult or a child, who is seeking some resolution. So I think that we should be reassured that however complicated this landscape is, that people manage, to, their bodies manage to resolve that uh, in a way which doesn't damage uh, the complainant. And I would, I, I would think that we would take that, 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 we would go at it in that same spirit uh, of always keeping in mind what's in the best interest for that child. And I accept that sometimes there will be difference of opinion, but these are resolvable, and you can be reassured that they are resolved right now without the um, extension of the powers of the Commissioner's Office, because as we illustrated, there are overlaps in many parts of the system. You, the Memorandum of, of Understanding is obviously going to be a fairly high-level document. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you yourself state in your report that it's very difficult to deduce the proper functions of some regulators or complaints bodies as their remits may cover areas of significance from a children's rights perspective. Yeah. So, you know, you're going to the negotiations with bodies where you're having difficulty actually working out uh, what the proper function whatever the yeah. definition of proper function is, uh, how, is how, well, how long is this going to take? Well, in fact, that, that's the care inspector I think that you may be referring to, and they were the most enthusiastic in setting up a memorandum of understanding, and that's the body that has got the widest scope, or one of the widest scopes in terms of the use of their powers, uh, and they were most enthusiastic in terms of uh, engaging very early to say, we are more than happy to look at memorandum of understanding. 
but I think, I think it, it's actually your... Final, final question. Yeah. I would just like to say that the quote I gave was actually from your report where you were saying it was difficult to deduce the proper functions. This yeah. must make it quite difficult. Uh, yeah, but, but I think... Well, I, I don't have the page reference in front of me, but that was certainly the case with regards to uh, the care inspector. Mm. Uh, but I, 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 I repeat, I'm confident that we can work that out. And, and the evidence of that has been in the production of the report. Uh, even with this complicated landscape, you have confirmation from all of those bodies that they are satisfied with the interpretation that has been given in the report. And that was quite an undertaking. And I know of other bodies that are looking at the tribunal landscape in Scotland who are taking much longer to produce a report on it just because of those complications. Uh, Mary Scanlon. First of all, to say all the bodies are satisfied with your report, none of them have actually said that. And secondly, a memorandum of understanding is something that we would absolutely expect from every organisation. And these are all thoroughly professional organisations, and I would expect no less. So saying a memorandum of understanding doesn't mean we are willing and we want, you know, it's not an endorsement of what's happening. It's an integral part of professional practice. Um, so my first question, convener, is how many uh, children's complaints have you turned away in the past year because you didn't have the... Uh, individual case handling powers that uh, are contained in the Act. How many, okay, how many think, were turned away? I think this is getting at the volume of traffic that we It's a expect. simple question. Yeah, and, and it's to do with the volume of complaints that are likely to be made. So I would like to refer you to the supplementary evidence that we provided as a result of my last appearance when we gave details of the estimates of the number of children that would make complaints. And on the basis of the evidence from Wales and Northern Ireland, we factored up the child population and came up with a figure of 870 complaints that we would have to handle on just on the basis of the similarity of roles and that was provided yeah, but as a result fair, of the I didn't ask evidence. about Wales and Northern Ireland I asked about how many people have come chapping at your door metaphorically speaking in the past year that you've been unable to pursue their complaints because you didn't have adequate powers and staff. I really don't want to know about Wales and Northern Ireland or indeed England. I'm, really, I'm just looking at Scotland. How many have you turned away in the past year? We don't have the complaint handling power right now. So yes. it would be, it's rather, well, I know I you say, don't. it's a question that we can't answer. And I'll be frank, I right. cannot answer that question because we do not have the power right now. That's what we're debating in terms of the yeah, extension I'm asking of how many, the, the Right, the, okay, the I'm not going to get an answer there. So my second question is, uh, I've read through the SPSO, Care Inspectorate, Human Rights Commissioner, Health Improvement Scotland, who are asking for a robust memorandum, Information Commissioner and Mental Welfare commis uh, Commission. And none of them have said, oh yes, there are real serious problems here that we cannot investigate. Therefore, there is a need for the Children's Commissioner to undertake investigations because we can't do it. They have all given us thoroughly professional responses. And as many of my colleagues have pointed out, uh, they've mentioned Information Commissioner, Care Inspectorate, clearly an overlap. Uh, the SPSO has uh, mentioned he wouldn't consider it appropriate to comment on interpreting another office holder's uh, advice. There are clear concerns from the Information Commissioner and others. So, uh, given that you haven't identified a specific case, None of these organisations have said, hands up, we're having to turn away people, we can't deal with them. We've discussed a cluttered and complex landscape, and much of what I've heard this morning uh, will be the remit of the named person. So it's already cluttered and complex. The government is about to undertake a consultation on the named person, now, don't tell me that it would be easier for a child in Betty Hill or Drumnadrochet 
to talk to their teacher or their health visitor and they would rather get a bus or a train to Edinburgh and come chapping on your door. I mean, do you not think it's already complicated? Nothing has been identified for you and it's going to be more complicated, if you like, or less, given what's happening with the named person. How can we clearly see the need for your investigatory powers, your signposting, your supporting, mediation or otherwise, how can we see that without seeing the end result of the named person legislation okay. and regulations? Okay. Um, I'd like to refer you to page 79 of the report, which is the case study three that we presented. Now remember, this report has been to all of the bodies, uh, and they have scrutinised that. Case 3 is an example where none of those other bodies uh, would be dealing with that particular case. And if there's time, convener, then it would be helpful to walk through that. I understand that. Question. Of course, we must answer the question, but we don't have an awful lot of time. We've got a lot to okay. do today. But, but it's to say it's, inappro it's wrong to say that we haven't identified a case that would be dealt with by these powers. And all of those other bodies are in agreement with the, with the chapter where we have given those examples. Convener, the example given is a child who's being disruptive in school. Now, I appreciate I didn't hear stage one, stage two, or stage three of the Children and Young People's Bill, but my understanding is that a child who is disruptive in school, the first port of call, and hopefully the last port of call, would be the named person who would use the GIRFEC arrangements, multidisciplinary, talk to social worker, etc. So, to me, uh, you know, there's no mention of the named person here in all of your pages, but to me, the example you've given that would be your responsibility, my well, understanding let's, let's is, let's see the commissioner my understanding is it's the named person. Well, with respect, the child in this instance has already made a complaint to the local authority, and that complaint hasn't been upheld. In other words, the named person is not, doesn't have a locus but in terms of the complaint that the child is making. They have already made a complaint to the local authority and ordinarily that complaint would, could then be escalated to the public service ombudsperson but they cannot deal with it because of the particularity of that uh, issue because the child isn't actually excluded. It's, it's, essentially, it's an internal exclusion in the school. So but, it, it wouldn't come under their locus the point, either. The, the point is, I don't know if you don't understand the legislation, but, mm -hmm. you know, at the moment, the Children and Young People Scotland Act, uh, um, the new complaints procedure regulations, so the, the, name, the regulations relating to the complaints procedure for the named person Part 4, Section 30 and the Child's Plan, Part 5, 43, will be consulted on over the summer. So there's the consultation to take place, and I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, convener, but also it has to be scrutinised and endorsed by this committee. So using an example to say, well, this is what's happening just now, in three months' time we'll be looking at regulations that will clearly define what a named person will do. So, you know, I can't understand why we're, we're looking at investigatory powers for you today, given that any example you've given me is for the named I, person. I, I, I don't want to curtail, I never, never want to curtail any member's questioning, but I think we've kind of covered that, and I, I, I'm just want, but, you've got, I just want to get a response from the Commissioner on the issue, which I think we've got, which is the, the you know, your question about where, you're, where you come in as a, mm -hmm. in terms of investigation. Yeah. Um, clearly, Mr. Raines earlier talked about um, uh, the role of a named person. We haven't got the regulations yet, but and that's still to be seen. But the role of the named yeah. person or others at that level. And then yeah. later on, it would be the okay. commissioner. Uh, well, with respect, I, it's understand. difficult to comment on a complaints process that isn't there yet I know, I appreciate and that. that the regulations haven't been passed. Nevertheless, I think it would be um, rather short-sighted 
to think that the name person will put an end to all complaints that go through local authorities. And so you will still have instances where a child has a legitimate complaint that goes to the local authority and it is not upheld. That is the situation in this, this case. So, yes, there may be another interplay with the named person. It remains to be seen, uh, and I'll be interested in the deliberations of the committee uh, in terms of how those would work. But it would be very short-sighted of us to think that just by having a named person means that a child's complaint would not be processed by the local authority and indeed found against. And that's the situation that you've got here. Okay. If you've got a very, very, final, very, short final, very brief, uh, paragraph 12 in the Information Commissioner's response, and she's responding to your 90 page and seven months in the making document. There is little mention in the report of working together with other regulators as opposed to dividing work between them. Why do you make little mention of working together, and uh, why don't you mention the named person? Well, I've got no doubt that we will be working with other uh, regulators, and if uh, the information commissioner is picking that up, we will certainly attend to that. Uh, we cannot operate this, and it's already been uh, stated repeatedly this morning. If anything, we'll be doing a lot. We'll be doing more work with the other regulators as a result of some of the the, um, the initial assessment. Uh, and in terms of named person, uh, then named person is, is it's to be decided really how that will be enacted in any case. And I've got no doubt that named person will appear in many other documents, our own included, once the, the working model is established. It hasn't actually been put into effect yet, and you're still debating the, the regulations on it. So I think there's a kind of, uh, we need to wait and see how that pans out. We're not debating, they're consulting on them. Well, well, and then the debate will come back to yourselves. You know, you, you'll make the decision on it. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm not sure whether, Gordon, you had, you're, you're okay then, uh, Liam, with a, an extremely short supplementary. I'll make it as brief as I can, thanks. Yeah. Convenient. Yeah, you'll have had the exchange I had with uh, Mr. Rains in the previous panel. Um, I suppose the, the, the concern is that while there is a legitimate process of um, seeing how this evolves through the, the memos of, of understanding and collaborative working with others. There's not as yet um, uh, certainty as to the volume of, of work that's required. Would it be unreasonable for us as a committee to assume that that then lends itself to a phased introduction of the capacity within your office to deal with um, a, a workload requirement that will uh, reveal itself over, over time? Okay, at the risk of repeating myself, we provided supplementary evidence to outline the volume of work that we expected, and that was to this committee, and we provided a full report to SPCB, which gave the rationale of where the, the, those same figures came from. So I'd, nobody knows the exact number, but the best that we can do is look at similar uh, op operations in other jurisdictions, and then look at that in terms of the child <coughs> populations. And in fact, we've taken the lesser uh, estimate, because the Northern Ireland estimate, if we factored that up, would be many more than the 870 that we've estimated. Uh, and in terms of a phased uh, um, uh, uh, introduction, I think I actually covered that in, when, when I responded to SPCB. But I'll repeat again that we're talking about a new function here. We need specialist staff. We need people who can actually understand this landscape. It's already been said numerous times today about how complicated this is. And if we, if we don't have sufficient staff to deal with it, then quite frankly, that will place the office in an invidious position where expectations on children and young people will be high and their ability and capacity to deliver will be low. And that's just not the way that we should be going about setting up a new function of the office. Um, all three of you for coming along this morning um, uh, to explain the position and certainly also thank you for the report that you published um, on the matter. So it's been very helpful to the committee. Um, can I thank everybody who's been along to discuss this morning. I think the committee will discuss this matter possibly next week or the week after. Um, I, uh, but we'll do that as soon as possible. Can I now suspend to allow witnesses to leave and to allow the set up for the stage two proceedings?
Uh, welcome back. Our next item is stage two consideration of the British Sign Language Scotland Bill. Can I welcome Mark Griffin, the member in charge of the bill and his officials, and Dr Alastair Allen, Minister for Learning, Science and Scotland's Languages, and his officials. Can I remind everyone that officials are not permitted to participate in the formal proceedings? Can I also welcome Dennis Robertson, who is not a member of the committee but who has lodged some amendments today? Uh, everyone should have a copy of the marshalled list of amendments, which was published on Friday, and the groupings of amendments, which sets out the amendments in the, orders, the order in which they will be debated. As usual, uh, the proceedings will be interpreted in BSL. For the benefit of those who are following today's proceedings, I will run through the main procedures. Uh, there will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak, sorry, to speak to and move that amendment and to speak to all other amendments in the group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate that by catching my attention in the usual way. If they have not already spoken on the group, I will invite the minister and then Mark Griffin as the member in charge to contribute to the debate just before I move to the winding up speech. Uh, the debate on the group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up. Following debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the first amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or to withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the committee's agreement to do so. If any committee member objects, the committee immediately moves to the vote on that amendment. Um, if any member does not want to move their amendment when called, they should say not moved. Please note that any other MSP may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members are allowed to vote. Voting in any division is by a show of hands. It is important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerk has recorded the vote. Uh, although Mark Griffin is a member of the committee, as he is a member, a member in charge of the bill, he is not able to vote uh, during these proceedings. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section and schedule of the bill, and so I will put a question in each section at the appropriate point. Um, and it is our intention to get through all of the amendments today. So, without any further ado, can I call Amendment 1 in the name of Dennis Robertson, Group with Amendment 38. Dennis Robertson to move Amendment 1 and to speak to both amendments in the group. Dennis. Good morning, convener, and thank you. Uh, can I firstly put on record uh, my thanks to DeafBlind Scotland for the work that they have done in bringing this amendment forward? Um, I think we all uh, owe them a great deal of thanks um, because their work has been invaluable uh, in terms of raising the awareness uh, of the tactile BSL, which I'm sure many members we have not been aware of uh, prior to uh, DeafBlind Scotland bringing this forward. Tactile BSL is BSL, convener. Um, but it, it is used when a person, usually when a person has a condition like Usher's syndrome, which is a sight losing, a, it's a, a, a condition uh, people are generally born with. But the a person can have injury or illness as well. And if you're deaf and then lose your vision, but your language has always been BSL, you continue to use BSL in sending or speaking to uh, people uh, within your immediate area. However, receiving BSL back needs to be different. It's tactile. A person then needs to do it by touch, by taking the person's hands and going through BSL. There are occasions when the person may have to use deafblind manual, but this is not a preferred method uh, for BSL users but it is a fallback position, especially sometimes to make things clear. With moving these amendments, convener, it is, in, it is imperative that it's, it's an explicit aspect to ensure that tactile BSL, and when we're referring to BSL, that we are actually referring to both. 
apart from in a Amendment 38.2, when it explicitly says that we don't have to um, a, have a, our final reports or plans, etc., in a tactile BSL format, which is understandable, and, and I would hope that uh, members would consider that uh, uh, later. But can I just say once again that tactile BSL is used by very few people, but when people are using this method of communication, it's extremely tiring and very frustrating. And you can imagine, convener, when a person has sight loss on top of their deafness, it can be quite devastating to that person. So there are other factors that we need to take on board, but perhaps not in this particular amendment. So I have great pleasure in bringing this amendment to the committee, and I would move these amendments in my name. Thank you, convener. One, thank you, uh, Dennis. Uh, if any other members wish to contribute, please indicate. Uh, can I begin with Liam MacArthur? Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I start by thanking uh, Dennis Robertson for, for um, lodging uh, these amendments and moving Amendment 1? Uh, can I also thank and uh, join Dennis Robertson in thanking DeafBlind Scotland uh, for their contribution, not just in the form of this amendment, but actually through our evidence session. I think uh, colleagues will recall uh, that during that uh, evidence gathering uh, process it was recognised that there are specific needs of the deafblind community that need to be uh, reflected in this bill and I think to be fair to the Scottish Government to the Minister they very much acknowledged that in, in, in their contribution to our deliberations so um, I welcome these amendments um, there may be other aspects of the bill that uh, need to be amended to, to better reflect the, the specific needs of the deafblind community but I'm certainly supportive of the principle here. Thank you. Any other member at this stage? Okay, I'll just make a short contribution myself. I am, can I um, also thank Dennis Robertson for bringing forward this amendment, which I, amendment one, which I support. Uh, I think the, um, the reason why I support it is that the, I met with uh, members of the public who are deafblind at Deafblind Scotland recently, including a constituent who wrote directly to me and asked me to meet with him to discuss uh, the possibility of this particular amendment. Um, and I think they provided a very solid and cogent argument as to why it was necessary to, uh, pr to support this particular amendment. So I thank them for uh, that meeting uh, and for the clarity of their argument in supporting this amendment. Um, so I'm quite happy to support it. I think it adds to the bill uh, and provides clarity for those members of the public who are deafblind that it isn't just BSL itself, but it also tactile BSL is covered by the bill. Um, and with that, um, can I call the Minister? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, likewise, I'd like to, to thank Dennis Robertson on lodging those amendments. Um, although, as has been said, uh, all people who use BSL should benefit from this, this bill, there is a real, and I think it's a justified concern, that deaf, blind people who use, as has been described by Mr Robertson, a tactile form of BSL uh, might not benefit fully from the, the bill because of the the relatively small numbers of involved and the complexity uh, of communicating uh, uh, tactile BSL. Likewise, convener, having met uh, uh, a number of uh, deaf-blind people uh, in the course of the discussions around this bill, uh, I would certainly accept the arguments put forward very passionately by deaf-blind Scotland uh, and by many of the deaf-blind people they represent, uh, that including a specific reference uh, within uh, the bill uh, to tactile BSL uh, is helpful and will ensure that the needs of that group of people are not forgotten. So, um, together, I believe, with Mark Griffin's amendments uh, around uh, consultation on BSL plans and making them accessible to deaf blind people, uh, I think these amendments from Mr Robertson will be uh, helpful, uh, and uh, for those reasons, the Scottish Government is certainly very supportive of them. Yeah, thank you very much, Minister. Can I call Mark Griffin? I'd also like to thank Dennis Robertson for tabling these amendments today. I think um, when we drafted the legislation, we had um, imagined that the term BSL would cover all BSL users, but I think we do recognise um, that there's an extra emphasis um, should be put on the needs of deafblind BSL users, and I um, was happy to meet and work with um, Deafblind Scotland and to support the, the introduction of um, this amendment. I think the, the formal words in tactile forms of BSL means that 
um, no deaf, blind BSL users should be uh, left out with this legislation, and, and I support this amendment. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Um, can I call Dennis Robertson to wind up and to indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you, Convener. And can I welcome the support uh, from yourself, the Minister, and the Member? Can I maybe just put into context, in winding up, um, that it was a deaf, blind person that taught me BSL? And a, I sincerely um, thank Stephen Joyce from DeafBlind Scotland for his patience in, in actually going over BSL. Convener, you can imagine the difficulty. I have no sight. And Stephen is a deaf blind user. So, therefore, we had a great deal of tactile BSL interaction. And he was extremely patient. And this is why I know that sometimes uh, you need to use sometimes a deaf blind manual to actually explain points. And uh, I did manage to get it wrong on several occasions. But uh, Stephen was extremely, extremely patient. And I just wanted to bring that to the committee's attention, that it's extremely tiring, but it's extremely beneficial. And even to teach someone who is blind BSL is an achievement in itself. Uh, and I commend the work that Deaf Blind Scotland do. And I would like to move the amendments in my name. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, therefore, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 2A, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 9? Get the Minister to move Amendment 2 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce these important amendments, which uh, seek to reduce the number of plans by bringing public bodies, other than those to be separately listed in the revised Schedule 2, within the scope of the National Plan, which give greater clarity about the purpose of the National Plan, lengthen the reporting cycle, which reduces the administrative burden on the public sector, and ensure that the Bill will focus on action rather than on administration. I would like to go, if I may, through uh, some of the provisions of Amendment 2 in turn. Subsection 1BA requires the National Plan to set out what Scottish Ministers will do and what they will consider that relevant public authorities should or could do to promote British Sign Language. Under this provision, the National Plan will set out the agreed national priorities to be taken forward by national public bodies covered by the plan and by public bodies preparing their own plans. Uh, this, I believe, strengthens the provisions of the Bill as published. The first National Plan is particularly important. Uh, as I explained in evidence to the committee at stage one, uh, we intend to set up a BSL national advisory group to inform its development. The group will involve a significant proportion of deaf BSL users as well as representatives from public bodies subject to the bill. We think it will take time to agree a suitable structure for the group and a process for recruiting deaf BSL users to it. Therefore, allowing two years after the Act comes into force to publish the first National Plan as set out in Section 11D will give us time to engage properly with the deaf community and public bodies, and this will enable us to publish a more considered plan which takes account of the views of deaf BSL users who will benefit from the actions set out in the plan and of public bodies who will be delivering those actions. Subsection 1E provides that national plans are published every six years rather than roughly every four years under the Bill as introduced. The Scottish Government takes the view that a four-year cycle for the reporting and review process set out in the Bill is, in our view, too short. This view is informed by our experience of implementing the Gaelic Language Scotland Act, which had a five-year cycle, uh, which some authorities have suggested is too short. I originally suggested a seven-year cycle, uh, but many deaf people who submitted evidence felt this was too long, so our amendment proposes a six-year cycle instead. Extending the cycle will, I believe, give public bodies longer to implement the actions set out in their plans and gather meaningful information on progress before they are asked to feed into the National Progress Report. As members will have seen from the revised costings I have provided in my recent letter to the committee, Requiring public bodies to produce plans every six years rather than every four years 
also leads to a significant cost saving. We propose to invest these savings in providing support to help public bodies better understand and meet the needs of the BSL community they serve and to boost the capacity of translation and interpreting services. In my view, Amendment 2 introduces a more proportionate approach to the reporting process and creates a less bureaucratic and more action-oriented action focus for the Bill. Amendments 4 and 6 ensure that the second and subsequent national plans have regard to any recommendations coming out of the review process. Amendments 5 and 7 are minor consequential amendments around the consultation provisions. Amendment 9 is a minor consequential provision in relation to the timing of the preparation of national plans. And if I, if I may turn to Mary Scanlon's amendment, uh, can I say I share her concern about the issues faced uh, by parents with a deaf child, and these are issues we have discussed in committee before. I think it is um, very likely that relevant material will feature in the first national plan, but in my view the amendment does not fit with the approach that the Bill takes. The Bill creates a framework for action, but deliberately does not specify what should be included in the national plan. As the member in charge said during stage one, it will be up to the government to choose what resources to put into its policy priorities. All that I am setting out is the overarching strategy that the government should promote. The content of the national plan will be determined through extensive engagement with the BSL community, and I have committed to including parents with deaf babies on the national advisory group which will support that process. So I do not think it is appropriate to go further than that at this stage because writing into legislation what should be included in the national plan I believe preempts that important process which I have set out. And as Mary Scanlon will be aware, the British Deaf Association has identified uh, eight areas which it believes should be included in the national plan uh, of which support in the early years is only one. If an amendment is passed, this could open the way to further attempts to legislate to include other priorities, uh, and I think this does uh, undermine the collaborative approach to developing the national plan uh, which I have set out. And, uh, thank you for your forbearance, but I think there were some important issues to be detailed there, Convener. Yeah, indeed, Minister. Thank you very much for that. Can I call Mary Scanlon to move Amendment 2A and speak to all amendments in the group? I won't be speaking to all amendments, but I will speak to Amendment 2A. I, I mean, as you know, Minister, I'm looking for a commitment uh, within the National Plan, and I do appreciate that the National Advisory Group has still to be set up, and I do appreciate that consultation uh, will take place as well as time. Um, but I was very struck, and I think as any other committee member or MSP, when we look at a bill, we do learn a huge amount, and I have to say the scrutiny of this bill has not been any different. But I found the briefing papers from the National Deaf Children's Society, as well as others, very interesting. And I was particularly struck by the way that they highlighted uh, the 90 per cent of deaf children are born to hearing parents. Uh, and uh, on one of the, our committee visits, we heard about the difference uh, to a child of having parents who used BSL compared to another. And we're obviously looking at attainment uh, for deaf children as well. And uh, personally, I just can't imagine the difficulties a child would have not being able to communicate with their parents. And I cannot imagine, as a parent and a granny, uh, how difficult it would be not co being able to communicate with your child or, or grandchild. So uh, I think a lot of the time, convener, in this committee, we've looked at the BSL support for children. We've looked at the shortage of teachers. We've looked at issues related to teacher training. And I think we've scrutinised the bill fairly effectively so far. What we probably haven't focused on too much is the support from the family that is so hugely beneficial within that. Um, I think I almost got a commitment. I retire next year, so I'm not going to be here when the national plan is done. But I think I almost got a commitment, but I would perhaps look for a, a, a more formal commitment from the minister uh, that he would do whatever is possible to ensure that there would be BSL support, not just for newborn babies, but 
for children and for families uh, where it was appropriate because I do think this adds so much to the whole BSL uh, provision within Scotland. So I look forward to hearing what the, minister, the Minister's response. Thank you very much. Um, any members wish to contribute at this stage? Um, I have a, one contribution which is really um, or, uh, to ask the Minister a question. Um, could you just maybe provide a little more detail on the changes to the, the cycle, the length of the cycle for the publication of the National Plan? Um, I know we had some debate about this obviously during the stage one uh, evidence taking uh, on the bill, but clearly um, it was a, a point of some contention for some members about it being too long possibly if it was extended. Uh, and while I agree that you have gone from seven back to six, which I think is welcome, could you perhaps give some more detail uh, about that um, if you don't mind? Uh, and I have to say I do accept one further point. I accept the Minister's argument about Amendment 2A in the name of Mary Scanlon. The bill itself does not lay out specific support provisions um, on the face of the bill. We'd, we had some of this discussion at stage one, whereas the amendment does exactly that. Um, and therefore, I think it is not in keeping with the, the tone of the rest of the bill. And therefore, I can understand why the minister has said what he said, and I, and I would tend to support that. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, can I call Mark Griffin? Thanks, Peter. Um, with regard to the, the timing of the, the plans, it was. Um, my intention that national plans would be linked to um, each cycle of the Parliament, so it would be a four or five year um, cycle so that um, national government would produce and then scrutinise um, their own plans and we wouldn't have a, an incoming administration uh, dealing with the, the policy intentions of a, a previous um, government. That was um, my intention and the reason the bill was drafted as it was, but I can see why um, the, the fixed term um, straight six year cycle is, is much more simpler in terms of early dis dissolution of parliament um, and, and other, other issues. I think in consideration of um, administrations implementing and scrutinising um, their own um, plans that perhaps we had not thought it through to the, the next um, level where local government in following the same cycle as a um, Scottish Parliament, um, Scottish parliamentary cycle would then be out of sync and so local government would be in the same predicament if we stuck with the, the parliamentary cycle where an incoming administration could possibly be scrutinising the performance of a, of a previous one. So I accept um, and support the amendment to, to bring the, the cycle into a, a, a fixed time frame um, rather than um, on the basis of a, a parliamentary cycle. Um, I, I can also see um, the arguments for allowing more time from the, the start of the process. I think that is crucial to make sure that the, the right people are on board um, on that national ad advisory group to inform that first national plan. So I also support um, that amendment. So I support the amendments in this group 2, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 9. Um, in relation to Mary Scanlon's amendment, I think I, I would agree with all of her comments in terms of the need for support for um, learning BSL for parents, hearing parents who, who have deaf children, but it does take, the amendment does take a step away from the intentions of the legislation. I think there are a number of priorities um, for the BSL community and support for parents of deaf children are, are one of those priorities. And I've not been persuaded that um, the argument for this one priority to be included um, within the bill should take any precedence over um, any other particular priority. I think it's right and proper um, that we should allow the, the National Advisory Group to be convened and for them to consult and decide on um, their own priorities rather than setting that in stone here at, at this point in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I call the Minister to wind up on Amendment 2? Um, in response, Convener, to the, the point that you, you raised about the, the time uh, scale or the, the length uh, uh, of, uh, of the, between the plans and, and reporting, I would essentially make many of the same arguments as, as Mark Griffin has made. Um, uh, and to add to that also my, my own experience, I think anecdotally of, of uh, the Gaelic Language Act is that 
Uh, the four-year plans there, uh, I think, uh, without taking away from the importance of, of those plans, uh, can lead to uh, possibly a, uh, an over um, uh, or, or an, ex an excessive degree at times of, of work um, around planning rather than implementing plans. Um, I think uh, around the points that uh, Mrs Scanlon raised uh, around uh, the, uh, the wider issues of, of families uh, who have deaf children, uh, as, I, as I indicated, I, I accept many of the, uh, the reasons behind or that many of the, the, the considerations behind our, our amendment. Um, uh, uh, however, uh, the, to, to, ask, to answer her point as well about what the Scottish Government is doing in this area, um, the Scottish Government has recognised the importance of, of supporting uh, families with a deaf baby, providing uh, half a million pounds recently to the National Deaf Children's Society uh, for its family sign project. Uh, there are many ways in which we can uh, engage to ensure um, that families uh, in this situation uh, have all the resources they need to, to communicate with uh, a deaf baby or toddler uh, or indeed as the member alludes to uh, an older child uh, at school so they can get the best start in life and address a subject which I know uh, is of, of concern to both Mrs Scallon and myself which is uh, around closing the attainment gap that uh, continues to exist uh, for, for deaf children. Uh, I would, however, uh, ask Mary Scanlon not to move Amendment 2A, uh, uh, but to, to note the commitment that I have indicated to include uh, families of deaf babies uh, on the National Advisory Group. Uh, like Mr Griffin, I would be of the view that uh, these are things that are better determined by that group rather than through legislation. Thank you very much, Minister. Can I call Mary Scanlon to wind up on Amendment 2A and to indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw that amendment? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the, the whole purpose uh, of this amendment was not to meet, set any precedent or priority and to see that one group was more deserving of or than another. It was really just to make sure it was on the agenda and that families did get the support at that critical uh, time and to help them communicate with their uh, children. Um, I do note the commitment that uh, the Minister made and I'm delighted uh, with that commitment and I also acknowledge that this is not the place for us to be telling the National Advisory Group what to do and it's not the place or the time to be looking at regulations. I, I fully uh, and absolutely understand that. I'm pleased that I brought this amendment today. I do think it's moved forward and I do think the commitment from the government financially and otherwise to the National Deaf Children's Association uh, uh, Scotland is very welcome, Convener. So uh, given all that, I will not be moving the amendment in my name. I'm afraid you already moved it. Um, that was the, the purpose of the original, your original statement, so you will have to seek to withdraw it. Oh, I seek to withdraw it then. Uh, does, the does the committee agree to the withdrawal of that amendment? That's agreed, thank you. Um, the question is that uh, amendment to be agreed. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. Can I call Amendment 3 in the name of Mark Griffin, uh, group with Amendment 26. Uh, Mark Griffin to move Amendment 3 and speak to both amendments in the group. Mark. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, during the development of the, the bill, I think, took uh, a decision um, on balance um, in trying to reduce the, the cost burden on authorities in relation to the, the, the translation of documents into to BSL. Um, I think that the committee have flagged this up as an important issue uh, and it was a, a difficult deliberation at the time as to how we would, we would go on this. But I'm delighted with the committee's um, recommendation and also with the, the Scottish um, Government support that um, national plans and authority plans um, should be accessible um, to BSL users. Um, and uh, move the amendment in my name. Uh, thank you very much. Any members wish to contribute to this amendment? Uh, can I just say, Mark, that uh, and certainly I'm sure on behalf of all the committee that we're very grateful for you to move this, moving this amendment. Um, it was something that the committee felt very strongly about, that uh, uh, the national plan should include the fact that it would be published in BSL. So it's a very welcome amendment uh, in my view. Uh, and therefore, can I, with that, call the minister? Uh, the Scottish Government uh, fully supports these amendments. Uh, as members of the committee observed during stage one, uh, 
Uh, it would probably be fair to say it would be ludicrous for this Parliament to pass a bill requiring public bodies to produce BSL plans without requiring them uh, to translate these plans into BSL. As I said in the Government Memorandum, and as I am sure the Committee well understands, if plans are presented in written English, they will not be accessible to many uh, deaf BSL users who are the target audience. In the Government Memorandum, I suggested that the cost of translating authority plans into BSL should be subsumed by the relevant authority, since the requirement does not substantially exceed their current duties under the Equality Act 2010. However, as the amendment requiring translation of plans does represent a new cost arising as a direct result of the Bill, I have included it in the revised costings provided to the Committee, and it will be considered as part of the new burden. Uh, I would encourage the Committee to support these amendments. Okay, thank you very much. Can I, Minister, can I call Mark Griffin to wind up and indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw Amendment 3? Just to thank um, Convener for your support, the Minister's support and uh, the Committee's song, strong support for, for this amendment through its Stage 1 report and press the amendment in my name. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Can I call amendments 4, 5, 6 and 7, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? And can I invite the Minister to move amendments 4 to 7 on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 4 to 7? Uh, there is no objection. Therefore, the question is that amendments 4 to 7 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, that is agreed. Can I call Amendment 8 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with Amendment 18? Uh, Mark Griffin to move Amendment 8 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 8. Um, I have lodged these amendments as I wanted to make it absolutely clear um, that the needs of deafblind um, people should be placed on an equal footing um, wherever possible with other users of, of BSL um, with the operation of the Act. I think, um, as Dennis Robertson had already um, pointed out that those with a, a dual sensory impairment face distinctive challenges and that one size all um, fits approach won't um, quite work with, with BSL. So ensuring that that consultation is access accessible to members of the, the deaf blind community as well as those who are, are deaf uh, is essential. I think um, this uh, group of amendments complement the amendments already tabled in the name of um, Deb Dennis Robertson, they continue on from the, the, the work that um, I, the Government, and I think members of the Committee um, have undertaken with DeafBlind Scotland, um, and I hope members will support these amendments. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if other members wish to contribute, would they please indicate? Uh, can I call Liam MacArthur? Thanks, uh, Convener. Just very, very briefly, as I indicated in um, re reference to Dennis Robertson's earlier amendments, um, I certainly very much welcome the fact that we are now seeing a series of amendments at stage two, recognising the specific needs of the deafblind community, and therefore I um, wholeheartedly support um, Mark Griffin's uh, amendments in this group. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much. No other member has indicated they wish to contribute at this stage, so therefore can I call the Minister? Thank you, Convener. Um, as I've already indicated, uh, I fully support the importance of uh, engaging with BSL uh, communities so that uh, we can directly, so that they rather can directly influence BSL plans and help ensure that uh, public bodies deliver on the commitments set out in those plans. And as witnesses uh, have pointed out in evidence, uh, effective, effective engagement is a crucial part uh, of that. Uh, we have invested £390,000 this year in the Deaf Sector Partnership, which will help to support uh, effective implementation of the Bill if it is passed. Uh, and the most important function of the partnership will be enabling public bodies to engage directly uh, with the BSL communities they serve. It is that engagement, uh, I believe, which will help to ensure that the plans focus on the right things uh, and, in doing that, make a real difference in people's lives. So I'd also welcome the specific reference to deaf-blind people who use BSL uh, within uh, these amendments from Mr Griffin. Uh, as deaf-blind Scotland have argued, it is crucial that the small numbers of deaf-blind BSL users can benefit from the provisions of the Bill, and it is important that public bodies take steps to include deaf-blind people in the consultation on their plans. 
Thank you very much, Minister. Um, can I call Mark Griffin to wind up and to indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw? Uh, these amendments are, are supported make, to make sure that um, no BSL user is um, locked out from a consultation process that will um, drive forward a lot of the policy improvements that could um, improve their lives. Um, I think it's right and proper that um, deafblind BSL users should be included um, in that consultation and be given special mention to make sure that um, no one is, is missed out. Um, and press the amendment in my name. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with Amendment 2. Minister, to move formally? Moved. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's also agreed. The question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Can I call Amendment 10 in the name of Dennis Robertson in a group on its own? Dennis Robertson to move and speak to Amendment 10. Dennis. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, convener, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, with reference to this particular amendment, I believe um, that all ministers have a responsibility to ensure that they take cognizance of BSL, uh, deaf BSL users in all their portfolios. And with reference to that, I don't believe that we need to specifically have a lead minister being responsible. A Dr. Allen, I think, already has demonstrated that he is quite, I think, passionate about ensuring, as he was in the Gaelic language, ensuring that BSL is given the same um, recognition as any other language and any other responsibility that he has uh, within his portfolio. So in doing that, I'm only putting forward to the committee the suggestion that I don't believe we need a lead minister to take responsibility because I believe all ministers should be taking that responsibility and I move that amendment in my name. Thank you, <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Mr Robertson. Um, any other member wish to contribute, would they please indicate? And I call Liam MacArthur. You know, I, I think I would echo much of what Dennis Robertson has already said. I can understand the motivation behind the amendment, um, and I think it's uh, almost certainly put down a useful marker in terms of the importance that um, promoting uh, BSL within government uh, needs to, to, to form going forward. I think um, the Minister in his evidence to the committee gave, I think, some uh, fairly strong uh, assurances to the committee that that would be the case. It will be up to successive governments to reflect that. I'm a little wary about appointing ministers for each and every um, specific task, uh, but I think it will be incumbent upon uh, each uh, successive government to demonstrate how they are living up to uh, the letter of this particular piece of legislation and the spirit behind it. So on that basis, uh, I think I would support Dennis Robertson's amendment here. Okay, uh, thank you. I, can I also agree with both Dennis Robertson and Lee MacArthur on this amendment? Um, I'm sure that any future government will do, as Lee MacArthur has said, and ensure that responsibility for this particular area um, of ministerial responsibility is uh, paid proper attention to. But I do note in passing, of course, the minister's title which includes Scotland's languages, um, and I'm sure we'd all agree that BSL is one of Scotland's languages and therefore fits very neatly under the current Minister's uh, portfolio. Um, but with that, can I call the Minister? Well, can I likewise thank Dennis Robertson uh, for bringing forward uh, these useful amendments. Um, I agree it is important for Ministers to have clearly defined responsibilities uh, for particular policy areas. But um, the Scottish Government considers that assigning a lead minister for the bill and legislation is not particularly consistent with the collective responsibility of Scottish ministers. Now, all of that said, and as has been alluded to just now, uh, clearly uh, as a language, BSL will sit within my portfolio as minister with responsibility for Scotland's languages. And on that basis, uh, I would be very uh, supportive of this amendment. Thank you, Minister. Can I call Mark Griffin? Thanks, I think this section um, in the bill was provided for emphasis and um, resonance. It was never intended to um, create a new ministerial post, but purely for the Scottish Government to define um, ministerial responsibility for, for BSL. I, th I think there was perhaps a misunderstanding previously, and I think that was highlighted by the fact that um, when I initially 
um, lodged my proposal for a, a private member's bill in British Sign Language that it was initially allocated to the Health and Sport Committee um, and that um, some deaf or BSL users felt that um, the health uh, ministerial team were responsible for, for deafness in British Sign Language. I think um, through this um, process it is it's shown clearly and rightly that um, the Minister for Scotland's Languages um, is the, the right um, point of contact for any um, BSL users that um, the legislating um, for a particular um, role perhaps goes against the, how the, the government operates on the basis of um, collective responsibility and um, I fully accept um, Dr Allen's commitment to, to BSL as the, the lead minister and would support the amendment in the name of Dennis Robertson. Much. Uh, can I call Dennis Robertson to wind up and to indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw his amendment? Uh, I don't think there's any need to wind up, uh, convener, uh, and I'll just uh, uh, move the amendment in my name. Uh, thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings? Minister, to move Amendment 11 and speak to all amendments in the group. Well, these amendments are of a technical nature, which means I'm not going to trouble you by listing them one by one. Um, but they are necessary as a, a consequence of other amendments, particularly around uh, the decision to uh, decouple the reporting and review cycle from the parliamentary cycle. Um, they also reflect the changed approach to reporting on progress set out in a number of other amendments. So these amendments ensure that Section 3 of the Bill, which relates to listed authorities' British Sign Language plans, uh, is consistent with other sections of the Bill as amended. And I move uh, am uh, Amendment 11. Thank you. Um, no other members indicated they wish to contribute, so therefore I call Mark Griffin. Um, thanks, Queen. I, I appreciate that. Um, the amendments are of um, a technical nature. I think the Minister explained the, the content. I, I would not add anything further than just to say I support the amendments. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, do you wish to wind up? Merely to move. Okay, thank you. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Can I call Amendments 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 and 17, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Can I invite the Minister to move Amendments 12 to 17? On block. Moved on block. Thank you. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 12 to 17? There is no objection. Therefore, the question is that amendments 12 to 17 are agreed. Agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Thank you. Can I call amendment 18 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 8? Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I will say that again. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 19 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 11? Minister, to move formally. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 20 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 11? Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? It's also agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 21 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 22, 23, 24, 25 and 27. Minister, to move Amendment 21 and speak to all amendments in the group. These amendments ensure that Section 3 of the Bill is consistent with other sections of the Bill as amended and that it applies appropriately to authorities who are added to the list in the second or subsequent cycle. They also include further amendments on timing, again, uh, convener to ensure consistency with other sections of the Bill as amended, uh, and they are all consequential to other amendments. Thank you very much. No other member has indicated the wish to contribute, so can I call Mark Griffin? To, to add from the Minister's comments on to say support the amendments. Thank you. Uh, Minister? Uh, merely to move Amendment 21. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Can I call amendments 22, 23, 24 and 25, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Can I invite the Minister to move amendments 22 to 25 on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 22 to 25? 
There is no objection. Therefore, the question is that amendments 22 to 25 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. Can I call amendment 26 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 3. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call amendment 27 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 21. Minister, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. The question is that section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Can I call amendment 28 in the name of the minister, grouped with amendments 29, 30, 31, 32, 33 and 34. Minister, to move amendment 28 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Convener, my amendments here to section 5 of the bill seek to create a more appropriate and proportionate approach to assessing and reporting on progress in two specific ways. Firstly, by renaming the performance review a progress report. Because of the lack of baseline data and performance indicators for work in this area, a performance review in the traditional sense of the phrase would be very difficult. And secondly, by removing the requirement to name individual local authorities and to highlight poor performance. Uh, on reflection, we do not think it appropriate to name and shame individual local authorities who have, or authorities who have published their own plans, uh, as they will be authorities who are not accountable to Scottish ministers, uh, a point which was made very strongly by COSLA uh, as far as local authorities are concerned. We expect the assessment of whether or not progress made by a listed authority is satisfactory instead to be made through a self-assessment process involving feedback from DSL users. Listed authorities will be supported by the Deaf Sector Partnership, funded by the Scottish Government, to engage properly with their local BSL community so that this provides an effective mechanism for holding public authorities to account. It is our expectation that the progress report will highlight best practice. It will also highlight where further development is needed, but without identifying individual authorities. These findings would then inform the ongoing support provided to listed authorities through the Deaf Sector Partnership that I have just mentioned. We believe, uh, Convener, that uh, we will make better progress by using a carrot rather than a stick to support continuous improvement across the public sector. And the amendments therefore seek to shift the emphasis of the reporting and review process in that way. The progress report will be laid before Parliament by Scottish Ministers as required by the Bill and will provide an overview of progress at national and local levels since the plans were, since the plans were published and will describe uh, progress or otherwise against actions set out in the national plan. In practical terms, convener, uh, Amendment 28 gives listed authorities three years between publishing plans and contributing to the progress report in the second and subsequent cycles, although this will be two years in the first cycle. The timescale set out in the Bill, as published, only allows just over a year between the publication of authority plans and the performance review, uh, and we do not think that is long enough. Extending the cycle for reporting on progress in line with the cycle on publishing reports will also give public bodies longer to implement the actions set out in their plans and gather meaningful information on progress before they are asked to feed into the national progress report. Again, this creates a, a more action-oriented focus for the Bill, and we know from evidence given to the Committee at Stage 1 uh, that this is what PSL users would like to see. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Can I call Liam MacArthur? Thank you, Kavina. I certainly very much welcome this amendment. I think it reflects the concerns there were at stage one uh, about the, the Scottish Government finding itself uh, sitting in judgment of, of individual councils uh, who themselves are obviously responsible uh, to their own communities. Uh, I think the approach that seeks to garner best practice and share that as widely as possible um, is, a, is a sensible one. I think each local authority, public body for that matter, will be starting from a, a different position, it will face different challenges, it will have different opportunities to take forward the promotional uh, work around BSL and I, I think that is better reflected in, in the model suggested by these amendments. I think it may be a question for the advisory group going forward as to whether or not that is having the effect um, that it needs to have in, in, in spreading best practice more widely. But I think for, for now this is a common sense approach to, to the legislation. I certainly support the amendments in this group. Uh, thank you very much. Can I call Mary Scanlon? 
I, I did raise issues regarding this at stage one, and I, I, again, I'm very pleased to put on the record that uh, the issues have been addressed, and uh, it was on the basis that the, there's very little baseline data. So you may find in an area where there's very little provision and support uh, for British Sign Language that uh, you know they're making tremendous progress. Um, but you could find another area where the practice is e excellent and they might sit back and think, well, there's not much more that we need to do. So I think, we're, uh, I think to look at a progress report at every level, hopefully to bring everyone to a more consistent uh, level of support um, is wise. But I also, uh, as I raised in the stage one debate, prefer the carrot rather than the stick. And uh, I don't think naming and shaming anyone is a good way to build partnerships or to encourage and incentivise organisations to come forward. Um, so I'm very pleased to see that a progress report has replaced a performance review and uh, I welcome and support these amendments. Thank you very much. Can I call uh, Mark Griffin? Thank you. Uh, my priority for the performance review was that it would provide a national overview of progress and allow stakeholders and interested parties to access information um, on the performance of local and national bodies. And I think the proposed progress report achieves that. I think the amendments bring the cycle for the production of progress reports into line with the production of the national plans. And I'm content with those changes. Um, a move away from parliamentary sessions means that the time scale for the publication of progress reports is simplified and um, does away with the need for special provision in the end of, event of early dissolution of the Parliament. Um, I also note that Amendment 32 removes the requirement to identify examples of poor performance along, among listed authorities and I understand that there were concerns um, with having what might be viewed as a punitive um, approach and that the amendments better reflect the, the relationship between national and local government and exactly um, who different levels of government are, are accountable with, where they're accountable to the electorate rather than, as I said, a, a different um, layer. I think Amendment 31 retains the requirement to identify and report on examples of good practice, which um, is welcome. Um, Amendment 3 confirms what is meant by the term um, relevant plans, which is now used in the Bill 29, 30 and 34, minor in um, technical um, or consequential nature. Um, and I would just say that I support all the amendments in this group. Thank you very much. Um, can I call the Minister to wind up? For the reasons essentially that Mr Griffin, Mr MacArthur and Ms Scanlon have given, in my view, our amendments create a more cooperative and proportionate and practical uh, approach to reporting on progress than perhaps the outdated and burdensome approach set out in the Bill as published and better reflect, I think, the relationship between national uh, and local government in Scotland. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, I move Amendment 28. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Can I call Amendments 29, 30, 31, 32, 33 and 34, all the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Can I invite the Minister to move Amendments 29 to 34 on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on Amendments 29 to 34? There being no objection, the question is that amendments 29 to 34 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's also agreed. Can I call amendment 35 in the name of the Minister, group with amendment 36. Minister, to move amendment 35 and speak to both amendments in the group. Minister. Uh, I've already set out why uh, we think that reporting and review cycles should be extended from four years to six years, and in my view, this would have the additional benefit of detaching the reporting and review cycle from the parliamentary cycle. Uh, while I appreciate Mr Griffin's original reasons for requiring Scottish ministers to report and then account for progress within the same parliamentary term, uh, I think this not only ties us into a time scale which is too short, but also which is uh, unnecessarily complex. So uh, I believe these amendments uh, are part of uh, an effort to simplify these issues.
Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, no members indicated the wish to contribute, so can I call Mark Griffin? Thanks, Commissioner. I accept that Section 6 and Schedule 1 are no longer required now that the Bill um, has to be amended to decouple the planning report and cycle from parliamentary sessions and so I support the amendments. Okay, thank you. Uh, Minister, do you wish to wind up? I move 35. Uh, the question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That has been agreed. Can I call Amendment 36 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 35? Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, that is agreed. Can I call Amendment 37 in the name of the Minister and a group on its own? Minister, to move and speak to Amendment 37. Um, Section 7 provides for the alteration of the date of publication of a plan or review in exceptional circumstances. Uh, this fitted with what the Bill previously said about timings for plans, uh, but it is really no longer le needed uh, under our uh, revised approach. No members indicated the wish to contribute, so can I call Mark Griffin? Um, I think there is no longer that. Um that need to be to, fle to be flexible now that the, the timescales have been adjusted to allow more time to prepare um, the plans and progress reports. Um, so I would support that amendment. Thank you, uh, Minister. Do you wish to wind up? Merely to move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 38 in the name of Dennis Robertson? Already debated with Amendment 1. Dennis Robertson, to move or not move? Moved, Convener. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 39 in the name of the Minister, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings? Minister, to move Amendment 39 and speak to other amendments in the group. Convener, this is a large group of amendments, uh, and I'd like to take a, a little while to explain them clearly. Uh, we are proposing a series of amendments to Schedule 2, which lists the authorities which will be required uh, to publish their own BSL plans. Some public bodies, such as Audit Scotland, the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner and the Scottish Information Commissioner, have been added to the list and so will require to publish their own plans. However, our amendments seek to remove some public bodies from Schedule 2. This does not mean that they will not be subject to the Bill, but that they will be covered by the National Plan, and I will say more about that in a moment. For example, Schedule 2 to the Bill, as it presently stands, requires bodies such as the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration, uh, the Scottish Further Education and Higher Education Funding Council, the Scottish Legal Aid Board, and the Scottish Qualifications Authority all to publish their own plans. We want to include them in the National Plan and so our amendments seek to remove them from Schedule 2. In addition, Schedule 2 to the Bill as introduced included some executive agencies uh, of the Scottish Government such as Education Scotland and the Student Awards Agency for Scotland. These are part of the Scottish Government and so will be covered by the National Plan. Our amendments seek to remove these and other public bodies with a national remit from Schedule 2. A number of other public bodies who are not currently included in Schedule 2 to the Bill will also be covered by the National Plan. For example, the Care Inspectorate, Children's Hearing Scotland, Creative Scotland, Sport Scotland, Visit Scotland and the National Galleries, Library and Museums of Scotland. Before I finish, though, I would like to say a wee bit more about the National Plan. The scope of the National Plan will be extended to include public authorities with a national remit who are responsible to Scottish Ministers. This means that the National Plan will cover the vast majority of national public bodies, including special NHS boards which have a national remit. This will reduce the number of plans being produced, which as well as reducing the administrative burden on the public sector, will I believe facilitate a more strategic and coordinated approach at the national level. All the national public bodies covered by the National Plan will be accountable to Scottish Ministers and that it is my view that incorporating them into a single National Plan strengthens rather than dilutes their accountability. 
So in closing, as a result of our amendments, it is our intention that 147 public bodies will either be covered by the national plan or required to produce their own plan, including nine executive agencies or other organisational units which are part of the Scottish Government, some of whom were listed separately in Schedule 2 to the Bill as introduced, as compared with 117 in the Bill as it currently stands. Although the public bodies to be covered by the National Plan will not be listed in the Bill as amended, I have provided details of these in my letter to the Committee Convener of the 21st of May, which I hope is helpful. This is now on the public record and confirms those to be covered by a single National Plan, which, as I said earlier, will enable us to take a more strategic approach to BSL at the national level. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, no members have indicated the wish to contribute. Sorry. Liam. Yeah, just very briefly, Call Liam MacArthur. Sorry, I, just very briefly, convener. I mean, I, I think the, the rationale behind the amendments is, is very sensible and the approach very sensible. Uh, I, I think it would probably though bear um, repeating that um, in taking that approach, we absolutely need to make sure that there is a sense of ownership and responsibility by each of those public authorities for the contribution they make to delivering that national plan. But certainly the approach, I think, is one that uh, makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much, Liam. Um, can I call Mark Griffin? Thanks, I thank the, the Minister for his explanation and understanding um, that the intention behind these amendments is to bring those national public bodies which are accountable to Scottish Ministers and are originally listed in Schedule 2 under a single national plan. Um, I accept that that will enable a more strategic and coordinated approach to producing the national plan and also have the benefit of reducing the workload for many of um, those bodies. Uh, we cut down on in duplication when it comes to consultation and um, on cost. But I do take on board and reiterate the point that Liam MacArthur made in terms of national bodies taking ownership and responsibility for their own actions um, within that um, national plan. It was my intention that Schedule 2 should be a starting point for the discussion as to which bodies should be included in the Bill. I drew up that original schedule by focusing on the key public-facing um, bodies in priority areas of education, health, justice, local government and policing. And I, I'm content that the proposed amendments to this schedule increase the, the number of bodies who are affected by the Bill will um, well, it doesn't increase the costs, and so I welcome those amendments. Thank you very much. Uh, can I call the Minister to wind up? Uh, thank you, Convener. To, to pick up on the point made by Mr MacArthur, the National Plan uh, will certainly be able to pick up on the specific areas of interest to different bodies, uh, um, but overall our, our amendments to Schedule 2 ensure that the Bill will have broader reach and greater impact on the lives of deaf PSL users. Uh, and that the approach that we're taking at a national level uh, will be more coordinated. And I, I move Amendment 39. Thank you very much, Minister. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Can I call Amendment 40 in the name of the Minister? Group with Amendment 46. Minister, to move Amendment 40 and speak to both amendments in the group. Minister. Convener, these amendments are minor and have been included as a consequence of other amendments. They add into the interpretation section terms that have been added by the Bill by other amendments. Uh, amendment 46 creates a new section after Section 8 which deals with interpretation of terms used earlier in the Bill, namely authority plan, national plan and relevant public authority. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, nobody else has indicated, so can I call Mark Griffin? No comments other than to say I support the amendments. Minister to wind up. I move Amendment 40. Okay, thank you. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. It's agreed. Can I call Amendments 41 to 45, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Can I invite the Minister to move Amendments 41 to 45 on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on Amendments 41 to 45? There is no objection. Therefore, the question is that Amendments 41 to 45 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. The question is that Section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is also agreed. Can I call Amendments 46 to 57, 63 and 59 to 62, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Can I invite the Minister to move Amendments 46 to 57, 
63 and 59 to 62 on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 46 to 57, 63 and 59 to 62? Uh, there's no objections, therefore the question is that amendments 46 to, 46 to 57, 63 and 59 to 62 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Schedule 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Sections 9 and 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Um, I am glad to say that ends stage two consideration of the bill. Can I thank the member in charge, uh, the minister and their officials for attending today. Very grateful uh, for your attendance and also uh, thank Dennis Robertson for his attendance as well. Uh, the bill will now be reprinted as, amendment. as amended. The Parliament, however, has not yet determined when stage three will take place, but members can now lodge stage three amendments at any time with the legislation team. Men members will be informed of the deadline for amendments once it has been determined and we will publish further details on our website and on the BSL Facebook group. Today, as I say, concludes the committee's formal inv involvement in the bill and I would like to thank everyone who has contributed to our scrutiny of the issues. Uh, the many witnesses who of course gave evidence to us, uh, Windsor Park Sensory Service in Falkirk and Deaf Action for hosting a, the, a visit from us. Uh, the many people who gave their views and comments on the bill via our Facebook group in particular, and finally, of course, to thank uh, the BSL interpreters who have supported us throughout this process. Can I thank all of the people who have been involved in this process very much, and can I suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to leave? Thank you.
Our next item is to take evidence on the Education School Lunches Scotland Regulations 2015 draft and the provision of early learning and childcare specified children Scotland Amendment Order 2015 also draft. Can I welcome Fiona MacLeod, the Acting Minister for Children and Young People and our supporting officials from the Scottish Government. After we have taken, taken evidence on the instruments, we will debate the motions in the name of the Minister at, at item 4. Officials are not permitted to contribute to that formal debate. And can I invite the Minister to make some opening remarks on both instruments? Minister. Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, Committee. Um, I'd like to make a brief statement in relation to the draft provision of early learning and childcare specified children, Scotland Amendment Order 2015, and the draft Education School Lunches Scotland Regulations 2015. I think it would be most helpful for the Committee if I started with the specified children amendment order and put it in context of the overall policy objectives. The key priorities of the Scottish Government's early learning and childcare policy are to improve outcomes for all children, especially those who are most vulnerable and disadvantaged, and also to support parents to work, train or study, especially those who need routes into sustainable employment and out of poverty in order to support their families. These policy priorities are why the Children and Young People Scotland Act increased early learning and childcare from 475 hours a year to 600 hours per year, put a choice and flexibility on a statutory footing for the first time and extended eligibility to the most vulnerable two-year-olds, those who are or have been at any point since their second birthday looked after by a local authority or the subject of a kinship care or guardianship order. The committee will remember that in January 2014, the then First Minister announced further expansion of the entitlement to early learning and childcare for two-year-olds. That is, for those with a parent in receipt of a certain out-of-work benefit, around 15% of Scotland's two-year-olds, and that was from August 2014. And then those under the free school lunch qualifying, qualifying criteria, which would take us to around 27% of Scotland's two-year-olds to come into force in August 2015 this year. The provision of early learning and childcare specified children Scotland Order 2014 was made under the Children and Young People Scotland Act and defined all three and four-year-old children as eligible and the first cohort are two-year-olds with a parent in receipt of certain out-of-work benefits. This amending order today will extend the eligibility for early learning and childcare to the second cohort of two-year-olds under qualifying criteria for free school lunches. Therefore, this draft provision of early learning and childcare specified Children's Scotland Amendment Order 2015 under consideration today proposes to amend the specified Children Order 2014 by adding free school lunch criteria not already covered. That is, where a parent or carer is in receipt of child tax credit but not working tax credit with an income up to the threshold for child tax credit currently £16,105 or both maximum child tax credit and maximum working tax credit with an income below a certain threshold currently £6,420 or universal credit or support under Part 6 of the Immigration and Asylum Act 1999. I should also point out that the thresholds for these tax credits can change annually under the Tax, tax, tax Credits Act of 2002. Turning to the Education School Lunch Scotland Regulations 2015, young children who are eligible for early learning and childcare are also entitled to a free school lunch where they meet the current free school lunch criteria set out in the Education Scotland Act 1980. However, one of the implications of, of extending early learning and childcare to this cohort of two-year-olds under the Children and Young People Scotland Act and to the two specified children orders, 2014 and 2015, that's a small number of those two-year-olds, will not meet the free, free school lunch criteria. This includes those two-year-olds who are or have been at any time since their second birthday looked after by a local authority, the subject of a kinship care or guardianship order, or those two-year-olds with a parent in receipt of incapacity or severe disablement allowance or state pension credit. 
Therefore, the draft Education School in Scotland Regulations 2015 before you today will rectify this discrepancy by adding the criteria that I have just mentioned to the free school lunch entitlement for young children. This will apply to all eligible young children in early learning and childcare to ensure that all two, three and four-year-olds have equal access to a free school lunch. We have worked closely with all our key stakeholders and delivery partners to discuss the practical implications of this commitment and to support its implementation from August of this year. So, in conclusion, convener, I would seek your su the support of the committee for both instruments to enable us to expand early learning and childcare to more two-year-olds and to ensure that those vulnerable and disadvantaged young children have equal access to a free school lunch throughout early learning and childcare. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, can I ask uh, members who wish to ask any questions to please indicate? And can I begin with Liam MacArthur? Um, and thank you, Minister. I very much welcome both um, instruments. It's been no secret um, that I, I hope this is a, uh, a, the latest phase in, 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 in an effort to go even beyond the 27 per cent. But um, I, I think having pressed uh, for the government earlier to, to go this stage further, um, I, I very much welcome this confirmation through the, uh, the statutory instrument uh, and the amendment order. Uh, today. Uh, likewise, I think in relation to uh, ensuring that those eligible two-year-olds um, have access to free school meals, that was certainly an, uh, an anomaly that was picked up um, uh, for me at a local level. Um, I should put on record the, the efforts of uh, Councillor Rob Crichton in that regard uh, in, in, I think, exposing what seemed to be um, uh, quite a, 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 a needless um, exclusion of those who were there clearly by dint of the fact that um, they, 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 the two-year-olds were from more disadvantaged backgrounds but weren't necessarily eligible for the free school meals that their peers within the, 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 the nursery setting uh, were entitled. So again, I very much welcome that. I suppose the only question I'd have, Convener, is in the discussions that you've had with the delivery partners, presumably the local authorities principally, um, what discussions there have been about the resource implications of, of extending this. Uh, I know in the Orkney context the overall numbers didn't appear huge, which actually added to the sense of uh, a, a, a frustration that it wasn't actually being done. But I suspect over the piece uh, the, the cumulative figure um, may be uh, not insignificant and be helpful to know how, how this has been resourced. They had extensive consultation and working, not just consultation, working closely with all delivery partners. And we have, COSLA has agreed the principle um, as long as provided that the costs that are incurred by local authorities will be fully met. Mm -hmm. And the government has estimated, estimated this around £600,000, and we can meet that within our budget for 2015 16. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mary Scanlon. Uh, I would also like to put on the record uh, to commend the Lib Dems, to be fair, in particular Willie Rennie, who has been very vocal on this issue, and uh, I, I very much welcome what is contained in these uh, two uh, policy uh, notes. Can I just ask, uh, and I ask it out of supportive goodwill, because I am very much in favour. Um, I understand that in England the percentage of two-year-olds is probably from memory, 38 to 40 per cent. I, I may be wrong, but I just wonder if it's possible, and it may not be possible for the Minister, but if it was possible for you to tell us what group and what cohort uh, is provided with early learning and childcare in England that's not covered here uh, in Scotland. I I'm sorry, I can't tell you about That's the criteria okay. for England, but perhaps to, to reassure you on the figures that, that we've um, come to, the 15% and now the 27%, yeah. that's based on the budget consequences from December 2014, you know, to, be, to, yeah. to increase the cohort of two-year-olds. We want to do this in a sustainable way. Yeah. We want to do it working with our partners. Yeah. So our first cohort last year was those two-year-olds in workless households and extending the criteria today will allow us to extend it to the families on the lowest of incomes. Yeah. So it's based on figures from the, the consequences from December 2014 but being done slowly to ensure that at each point we're, we're able to fulfil I welcome all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
a couple of questions, Minister. I just, I just wondered on both these um, regulations what the um, what the plan is in terms of how we're going to communicate with parents uh, the changes to the eligibility and who will be entitled to these. How, how will they get to know? We started on this last year with, with a fairly successful. We are working with the DWP so that when they identify parents in, in the, in, that can win, come within the criteria, they let them know that. We are also working with health visitors because health visitors are in the households of all the two-year-olds. And over the summer, as we did last year, we will have a large marketing campaign, radio, leaflets, uh, information to get out there. Thank you for that. And I've got one other question, which is specific to the school lunches regulations. It says in, in paragraph four of the policy note that the extended entitlement will apply to all preschool children where they are in a local authority ELC setting with a session spanning, spanning the middle of the day. I just wondered what a session spanning the middle of the day meant. What was, the, what was, <laughs> what was that defined as? Sorry. That's, that's, that's in the yeah. It is actually in the legislation as the middle of the day. Well, I just I, I, I'm, 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 I'm to one. curious. I mean, I'm, I'm Can I check that for you, convener, um, about specific hours? But yeah. I think it's about over lunchtime. Yes. So, if, well, so just, just to clarify, so if somebody had a, se a session, well, if, a, if a session is just a period of time, just in the morning mm -hmm. or just in the afternoon, mm -hmm. that wouldn't. No, it's if they are actually in their early learning setting over the lunchtime period. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> School lunch means anything provided under some oh, no, wait a minute. In the middle of in the middle of the day which the education authority consider is appropriate and no, that's about what the meal is. I'll have to get back to you with the act, with the no, specifics. I mean, it, but yeah, I sorry, think it's fairly clear the middle I, of the day you know, is just, if you're in there over lunchtime. I'm, I'm sure it's quite it seems quite obvious that it's those who are there across the lunchtime period who would get the lunch. That's yeah. not I just wonder whether children who were there up to the lunchtime period would get it or not or, or whether yeah. I will go and work out what the middle of the day Sorry, I think Liam McCarthy yeah, I, 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 I'm glad you raised that point. I mean, certainly it was the, the context in which it's been raised with me was with two-year-olds that were in a, a nursery setting over the course of the morning up to the lunchtime yeah. and then were getting flung out the door just as their, their, their peer group was no, settling down said to, to, me to, to a whole lunch. So I think yeah. if, if, if over the lunch period, in a sense, is, is simply seen as an extension of that um, delivery through the, the late morning, I think that would be seen as, as, as very very welcome. I think if it were simply those that bridge the lunch, lunch hour in terms of the, the, the learning setting, then that would be, that would yeah. be unfortunate. But I'll get back to you with more specifics, but that falls into, you know, we're, we're working hard, local authorities are working hard on the flexibility of the sessions that they're offering. So yeah. that's obviously going to be factored into that. Okay. 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 Um, thank you very much. Uh, no other questions. Move on to agenda item four. As indicated, we now move to the formal debate on the instruments, which is item four. Can I invite the Minister to speak to and move the motions in turn? Minister. Um, sorry, I haven't got which, which order do you well, wish me to we're move We're going to do 13291 first. Give me just a moment, sorry. That's, that's the school lunches one, sorry. Right, so... Right. Can I move the Early Learning and Child Care Specified Children's Scotland Amendment or oh no. I need sorry. So I need school to get lunches the right one wording. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Can I move the Education School Lunches Scotland Regulations twenty fifteen? Uh, thank you very much. Any contributions from members on the stage? No. Um, I don't think you need to reply then to any of those <laughs> Contributions. Can I put the question then that motion S4M 13291 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, Minister, I can ask you to move uh, S4M 13292. Can I move the provision of early learning and child care specified children's Scotland amendment order 2015? Thank you. Any contributions from members at this stage? No. Okay. Can I therefore uh, put the question that motion S4M 13292 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Uh, we are agreed. Uh, Thank you very much, and with that, I close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.